send money. Anyone hear that subliminal messaging uh, in the countdown? That was an ad that was saying, send money. But, you know, if you want to, go for it. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was not part of the programming. That was definitely not subliminal messaging. Um, but welcome. Besides that, welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Uh, I see a lot of people are here. Sorry I missed you last week. I had... <laughs> I had felt, and I feel this fairly often, uh, I had felt that I had hit my max of Rachel Hollis content for the week, for the month. Uh, we had a several videos come out, and by we, I mean me and myself, had several videos come out uh, discussing Rachel and little Dave, mostly Rach. Uh, Rach. 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 Um, so I felt like, okay, back it off a little bit because I don't want there to be a court order demanding so. So I, on my own <laughs> accord, took, took a break. So uh, I want the judge to see this. No, there is no judge. But if hypothetically there's ever a judge in the future, I want him to see that I have self-control, okay? But uh, I couldn't resist. A week was about as long as I can wait. Uh, there was so much to catch up on, so much to discuss. Uh, Hollisville is a never-ending saga that uh, never stops giving. So just to recap, and everyone let me know if you can hear me clearly, because I'm having, my, not mic issues, but sound, uh, lack of sound knowledge. So I'm trying to figure out uh, what the right volume is. So let me know what you think. Anyways, um, so you may have seen, we talked about Dave Hollis's return to his podcast, Rise Together, which was formerly uh, the Rachel and Dave podcast, which is now just sadly just the Dave Hollis podcast. He came back and he did a talk with sort of talk, kind of weird therapy session, unlicensed therapy session uh, by Gabby Bernstein on his uh, podcast, which I I like said was rise again. No, <laughs> rise again. Rise together. <laughs> rise again is what Rachel's trying to do. Uh, rise together podcast. It was super cringe. It made me go down a deep hole of Gabby Bernstein uh, research, which I will unveil at a later date. Uh, then Dave posted a, another episode, uh, like a rebroadcast, so an old episode. And then he came out with a new episode where he rambled on for literally an hour let's see let me bring it up i'm not gonna play it because it well i couldn't even and I'm, i commented this several times on the hollis hollis unleashed no oh my god can i not say anything correct today hollis unleashed hollis uncensored reddit that it was so boring that i did not plan to cover it because it it, it there was no juicy nuggets. It was literally him repeating the same stuff he repeated a year ago, pretending that nothing had happened other than he had just gone through a rehab program, which he said, but we already knew that. So it wasn't boring. It was just boring. He was just saying the same stuff over and over again. I mean, okay, here's an example. This is at no point uh, in particular. This is just a random part, and it's probably going to be the most boring. I'll just pick a random part. Okay, random. Here you go. Boring. Oh, that's a song. Okay. <laughs> this part penetrable between self and my relationship that I have to it. I'm working on it. I wish I had a, like a fantastic ta-da, here's the answer kind of moment. But uh, if there's anything in this season, I 100% feel like I am wildly more the student than the teacher in any of what I am trying to process or work through. But um, I feel like I've made more progress on um, understanding who I am, which would then also inform who I can't be, uh, even if it means losing uh, you know, you get the point. He's 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 a student, not a teacher. Yet he's going through this podcast explaining how to be better like him. I don't know. The one thing I learned from this and I like I said, I could not barely get through it. It was nauseating because it just doesn't make sense. But the one thing I get I gained is that both he and Rachel have 
ridiculous running techniques. Rachel says she ran a marathon with no training while also voice memoing her entire address book, telling them why they mean so much to her and how accomplished she has become because of them, blah, blah, blah. Great, wonderful. Dave says he keeps his notes app open while he goes for 10 mile runs and will listen to sermons and podcasts and take notes about what he's learned. It's like, can't you just do one thing at a time? Can you just run? for the sake of running for fun? Do we have to have 12 different activities going on while we're running? Do we, do we, must we? Do we have to have gratitude pulsing through our veins while we sweat running down the street? That's why when I go for a run, I go for a 30 minute run here and there. <laughs> uh, I'm, no, I'm no trained athlete uh, or mathlete or uh, marathoner like our pals from the Hollis clan are, but that's the one time I don't have to think about anything. I could just listen to my music, listen to the Nike app sometimes if I'm in the mood to get a, tr you know, someone guiding me about how far left is to go. But the rest, I just chill. Is that so wrong? Can I just have that moment? That's what I learned. They have, they have unsustainable running uh, techniques. <sighs> Anyways, okay, so that was Dave. That's all I'm going to say about Dave. If you would like to go listen to that podcast, I highly don't recommend it. Um, I mean, you won't be offended, probably. It's very non-offensive, but it's just so, it's reminiscent of him f from when he got divorced and was just like spouting off, you know, I'm in a patio of peace reminiscing on my life and tomorrow I will be a different man because my creator did this and I am thinking, I was just like, what? I don't, I don't, no comprehendo, de holly so. Uh, so that's that. So uh, I thought <laughs> we'll skip to the good stuff because I took a week off. So I had time to uh, filter through some of the less exciting stuff. Uh, Rach talk last week was boring as well, uh, hate to be the bearer of boring news, but, um, the only interesting part, and so basically, okay, I'll just give you a rundown of this episode if you would like to hear it. So she did another fashion show in the beginning where she talks about, uh, this is my jacket. Okay, here, I'll just give you, you don't have to listen to it. I'll just tell you what she's saying. This is her jacket. She bought this jacket. She loves this jacket. Okay, cool. Uh, she loves Wordle. She's definitely uh, you know, on the trends, she's, she's playing Wordle. She loves Wordle, but it's hard. And she plays Wordle. Cool. Talks about Wordle for a long, long time. Uh, then she says how old she is. I believe she's like, Oh, 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 okay. No, I lied. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. Uh, she talks about how much of a mu music buff she is. She loves music, has always loved music forever never not loved music, it has nothing to do with her boyfriend being in the music industry, totally not. She's talking about Paul McCartney and, you know, this producer. She's like, I've, I've been obsessed with him forever, who knows, maybe she has been. Seems a little sketch to me, but okay. That's what she talked about for a long time. Then she talked about peeing her pants yet again. I've heard her pee her pants story. I've heard her tampon story, her peeing her pants stories, multiple stories her farting stories. I've heard every bodily fluid function of Rachel so far. And this is just another one of the run the mill ones. Uh, she said when she was zip lining, which I thought it was like a real zip line. She's in, like a, in an indoor park. She zip lined. She says she claimed she peed her pants. Cool. That was not exciting. That's what she's talking about here. The only part that I wanted to, and here she is doing this zip line if we want to see it. Okay. Here. Good to go. <laughs> you'll be fine. Also, I think that was her boyfriend in the background saying you'll be fine. And he doesn't sound British to me. I thought he was going to have a thick British accent, but you know, whatever. Uh, okay. The only interesting part, she's a weenie, blah, blah, blah. She's going to talk about this book. Um, oh, speaking of that, I have a moment for this. Dave, you're talking about peace, aren't you? No, I'm talking about buying my book. Uh, she's going to talk about a book about hormones. So I think this is important to point out because she, I th my prediction here is that Rachel, she tried to blame Toiletgate on 
cancel culture, right? That was her first attempt um, because she went on the Skinny Confidential. I did a whole video about it. We did a bit, we did a full review of it on cringe influencers. If you want to take a listen to the whole thing, the whole uh, podcast. But she went on there basically onto this, you know, <laughs> controversial no safe space podcast called the Skinny Confidential. And uh, basically said that, you know, she did what she did because she was overwhelmed and she, you know, was just defending people with depression and that, you know, Rachel's actually a hero and not the villain that she's been portrayed. And even if she was a villain, uh, cancel culture is unfair and, and uh, you know, should be abolished and cancel culture is so rude and no one's allowed to learn and blah 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 that was her whole thing didn't go over well i don't think i don't think it brought a lot of people back onto the rachel camp it just seemed like she was deflecting again and again so now i think her next move is to be like it was my hormones my hormones were off i'm a lady i guess men's hormones can be off too but usually the hormone conversation is very much uh, a female thing woman thing i hear more so and i'm not saying your hormones can't be off or misaligned or whatever i'm sure that there's tons of you know science that says that that's true however you know she's working with a doctor who's a doctor perhaps but not right i don't know i haven't fully fleshed that out yet uh, and so she's been talking about hormones a lot lately. And I think that's kind of her new reason as to why she was overly emotional, lashing out on her uh, TikTok and whatnot. So that seems to be the new uh, narrative moving forward. Um, and so she talks about it in this podcast or this Rage Talk. She talks about it in the latest podcast she just came out with, with Dr. Amen, my favorite uh, psychiatrist brain scan doctor and if you want to see my video on that i've also covered him and some of his uh sketchy research and such um so anyways so i will play this part because it's a little interesting about her period we're gonna hear a lot about her period lately anyways let's go it's like she's being forced there against her will while we're just like mario um mario just like one quick Hold one on. moment but also i love out of her out part okay. that we went girl shoot blah 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 blah, 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 blah. Been on okay here okay. it is so i have been on this journey for the last couple of years to better understand my body and to balance my hormones and really learn about my cycle i think this is something that all of us who have menstruation who bleed can really benefit from and I've listened to podcasts and watched YouTube videos and been reading a ton of books and I found my favorite. I cannot recommend it enough. It's called Period Power by Maisie Hill. I'm trying so desperately to get her on my podcast. So if you guys know her, please tell her to call me. Um, but it is so good. It's so good because she writes in such an irreverent, like your girlfriend sort of telling you all the things that you never knew about how your body works and how to work with your cycle, sort of what are your superpowers when you're ovulating or when you're menstruating or how you can set up your life in a way that works better with your body instead of against your body. I also learned a ton about just the structure of what's going on in here, what happens when you go through menopause or perimenopause, it's so much information but it's written in a really fun, informative way. So cannot recommend this enough. For any of you who are bleeders, this is the one that you need to grab next. I hate to be the prude here, but when people say, I don't know, if you're a bleeder, it's like, I don't choose to be a bleeder. I would much preferred not to ever bleed. It's like, ugh, I don't know. I, it's, a, it's a choice of language. It's just to me, just goes, oh God, can we not? But okay. I mean, I know I'm not, I'm probably, I'm probably more in the minority on that one. I just think like the terms like that, it's like, ugh, I don't know. It's like, I don't want to be associated with it. It's like, yeah, I don't want to be ashamed of it, but I don't want to be like, you're a bleeder as if that's my whole personality. It's like, uh, I don't know. Not my thing. And this is like something new for her. I've never heard her talk this way. She's also like cursing a lot more, which is fine. I curse a ton. Um, but like even in written form, she had a post the other day. It was like something about a book. And she was like, this is fucking amazing. It's like, okay, Rachel, whatever. So that's her. Uh, and I looked up the author of that just because, you know, why not? All right, guys, Oops. that is today's episode. Sorry. Um, the Maisie Hill person, the one that did the uh, period book. 
Uh, she ha- is not a doctor, so, you know, she's got, like, a some sort of degree in, like, like, acupuncture, perhaps? Something like that. It was, like, a bunch of stuff that she had done, but none of them being uh, health. Here's, here's the author she was just talking about. Um, also, if you wanted to meet Maisie and have a relationship, like a coaching relationship, um, guess how much? Put, put your guess in the comments uh, how much it costs for her, I hope it's not in here, to have one-on-one coaching by this person. Um, if you're thinking it's a number that's reasonable, you're wrong. <laughs> well, reasonable to me, I should say. Uh, okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, she's so quirky, cool. I don't know this person at all, but okay, ready to apply? Private coaching with me is currently 10,000 euros for six months of weekly sessions. I think that's a lot. I think that's a lot for a woman that's not qualified to tell me about my own period. But here we go. These are the people that Rachel's recommending uh, we do. And, you know, I, I don't know how much you can equate to your period causing uh, perfectionism, habitual people pleasing. You know, I don't know how much of that I tie into my cycle, but who knows? Who knows? I am just a YouTuber on the internet, so what do I know? But anyways, uh, that was the one piece of information that I thought was semi-interesting in that. Everything else was literally just like a drag, boring. Um, this one is pretty boring too, but since, hey guys. since it's the most recent, I figured, well, we can watch it together. Uh, there's a lot of, mm, boyfriend talk <laughs> for someone who doesn't want to ever speak about her boyfriend or her relationship ever again. She's using his name, not his name, but his, uh, his role in her life as her titles fairly often these days. And once again, I find it to be a red flag because... Do I have the red flag? Dang. Um, it just seems like her boyfriend... My boyfriend. Her boyfriend. Her... Boo thing. Just isn't the right match for her. Yet she pushes this narrative as if they were like lovers from a lost time or something. Like they they should, you know, they've, there's never been a love story like hers. So anyways, uh, she doesn't like his hobbies. He doesn't like her. <laughs> yet they remain together. Oh, and he he also walks into the shot, not into the shot. He walks into the studio, aka her home at one point. And why would they leave that in there? That's why I feel like this is all for content. But all right, uh, let's begin. We'll go through this and then we're going to listen to the podcast about uh, how to win in your divorce, essentially, how to be better after a breakup and there's some juicy nuggets in there. Juicy, I think, is maybe a strong word. Rachel is king, queen of uh, not saying much, but making it seem like there's she's about to say something good or she's about to drop a bomb and then backtrack and talk about herself and some random story from 10 years ago that has nothing to do with anything. So <laughs> keep your expectations low. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go. And let me know how the audio sounds, if they're matched well enough, too. Hey guys, welcome to Rage Talk, my weekly show where I sit here at home, drink caffeine, hang out with Jack, talk about random things. Today we are chatting through sex education, the fact that I cannot hear in restaurants and I feel like the oldest woman alive and also my boyfriend is the biggest nerd ever and I have to tell you the story and I love him and he's so precious but he's so lame. That's nice. Oh, also, I meant to mention this too at the top. Uh, I did the whole episode or I did a whole video about the one story she told in Rage Talk about her son Ford, who's nine, who got broken up with on Thanks- or Thanksgiving, on Valentine's Day. And you know, how I thought it was in, in poor taste. Uh, Mary Ellen Dance, a licensed mental health counselor, came on and uh, talked about it with me about, you know, why kind of that could be detrimental to children developing uh, like a story like that. And uh, that day or like the next day, Rachel reposted on her Instagram stories, the story about Ford, almost as if she was starting to get some sort of backlash and doubled down and posted it again. Cause it was an older episode of Rage Talk and she posted it once and I talked about that. And then she posted it again, like a couple days later. So 
I don't think she's got any regrets. And you know how I know that? It's because I pulled the sound bite. I don't regret anything. She regrets nothing. So here we go. Back to Rage Talk. Oh, hello. It's time. We're back. We don't know what we're wearing because we just are at the last shoot of this day. And we're also speaking in plural now. I'm referring to myself as we. We just ran in the bedroom and put something together. So this is what... I do that too. I literally did that in this podcast, in this episode so far. So I cannot fault her for saying we, because I also say we when I'm talking about myself. Maybe I learned it from her subconsciously. Anyways. What we're going with. It's a little bit, what was that cartoon that wears the hat deputy? Wasn't there like a dog that wore like, he was like a Canadian Mountie? Alexa, what's the cartoon that was a dog that was a Canadian Mountie? Klondike cat? Yeah. She's not wrong. But wasn't there one who wore a hat like this? Well, it looks like something. Deputy that dog. Was like, what a right? dumb segue. You know what it is? It's, um, what's that music producer? This is basically, if you've never seen Rage Talk before, which I'm assuming you have, but if you've never seen Rage Talk before, this is it. This is the whole show. Her not recollecting anything, talking about something that doesn't go anywhere, and then it ends. <laughs> This is a good uh, teaser for anyone. For, like, this is their first experience with Rage Talk. This is, this is how it is. Slash singer who wore the giant hat to the thing, because Pharrell. It's Pharrell. But Pharrell is always and forever going to be cooler than I am. Um, I really just wanted to wear a hat. What an intro. What an intro. Where is the Oscar? Where is the Golden Globe? Where are the awards for this show that's already so interesting? What are we talking about today, Jack? Can you tell the difference without my happy saffron though? I'm not saying my energy's not there, but I'm saying that my energy, the last shoot was like, boom, over the top. We're going, we're here, we're part of this. I was telling Jack I ran out of the supplement called happy saffron, this is not an ad. But when I did my... It is though, she's saying it's not an ad, but it is because happy saffron comes from Dr. Amen, the psychiatrist, brain scan, brain scammer, in my humble opinion, uh, that I did a video about where he tells everyone that they have brain issues and then uh, gives them his own brand of supplements to take. So this is her promoting that, which she just had him on her podcast. That was the podcast she released this morning. So this is an ad because she wants, she's in his universe. Maybe she's not getting a direct sponsorship from him, but this is not to say like, oh, I have not, I just, I love this product. It's like, you know, the owner, and you probably want to do some sort of partnership with him or something. I don't know. She puts him on enough platforms. My God, she's platformed this guy like 12 times and was on his YouTube channel and whatever. So that was her first attempt to, I think she wanted to say like her, it was her brain that caused her to do the TikTok. her brain health. No one really liked that. So then she switched over to cancel culture. Now she switched over to hormones. So quite the journey we've been on. Uh, she's talking about the supplement that he makes himself called brain md or something that's like you know twice the price of normal supplements or normal vitamins i should say I work with dr amen he's been on the podcast a couple of times you can watch him on youtube i did my work with dr amen and he had me try the supplement that he had it's his supplement but it's saffron zinc and like curcumin or something nothing crazy or wild but it's called happy saffron i swear this supplement, it just makes you have a great day. And I usually take it when I'm PMSing or on my period, it just helps with my moods a bit. See? And I ran out. The new shipment is supposed to come tonight at 7 p.m. And I, not that I'm tracking it or anything, because I need it. I need it because on Saturday, we start spring break. Wait a minute, is she going for spring vacation or is she going for spring break? <laughs> and I am taking my kids to Hawaii by myself for a week, spring break. Spring break. <laughs> all the things, all the kids doing it, living it, being it. I'm going to need a little mood elevation. I don't want to go on spring break and, you know, be like, oh, is it happy hour? It's 11 a.m. Calm down, Rach. Spring break. Woohoo. I Rach? <laughs> She's got that. <laughs> Reach. She doesn't see 
seem like someone who likes spending time with their kids. Just say. Notice, I'm noticing such a difference. This is not an ad. Nobody paid me to say that, but I really do think it's great. Jack takes it too, because I talked about it so much that he, he takes it too. Why am I rubbing my wrist? Because when I went to the trampoline park with Noah, I tried to impress her by doing a front flip with no hands. I wish that I had footage of the total decimation to my spirit and my soul as a reaction of doing one front flip on a trampoline. And when I landed, I landed badly on the old wristy poo. So I've been trying to get it back. I saw this comment. It's so true. <laughs> She's been on her period like every day. She's like, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding, I'm a bleeder, I'm bleeding, period. It's just like every second, it's like menstruation, I'm on it. It's like, oh my God, how? We've only been watching these for a month. <laughs> Anyways. Back in working order. <laughs> also, remember I told you guys a couple weeks ago about how dramatic I get when I hurt myself? I mean, I just, I wept. Boo was with us at the trampoline park and- Ah, oh, dang, everybody. Boo thing. I like it when boosting is mentioned within three minutes. We hit 401 before boo is mentioned. So, dang. She's, she's, getting, she's getting more self... She's got self-control like me. She's really stopping herself from bringing up her boyfriend uh, immediately. But he is in the title, so... My boyfriend. Boo thing. I mean, you gotta mention him at some point, right? Okay, so now she's gonna talk about her boyfriend. Her boyfriend, boo thing. And probably the reason I'm so dramatic is because of the just absolute tenderness that he shows me like a little baby like oh baby work yourself like we're that annoying couple we don't do it in front of you so don't be grossed out but like I really cherish it it's almost like I didn't get love and attention from my parents as a child so so if you didn't know, Rachel has issues with her parents. Uh, as someone who also has issues with their parents, I don't think it's a good excuse as to acting up or acting, you know, like a jerk. Uh, she brings it up a lot lately, too, about, like, how bad her parents are. And then will then say, like, oh, my boyfriend, my boo thing cares about me. It's like, yeah, because that guy has only known you for a year. I don't know. That's the thing. It's like you can't compare the actions of, of your parents to like, you know, their love and support to someone you've just met because there's a honeymoon period. People over time, it's much harder to ignore certain things or be consistently supportive all the time. So yeah, of course your boyfriend that you just met a year ago, he texted for the first time a year ago via her own story, uh, is going to be like, oh, baby, oh, your wrist hurts, unless he's a jerk, you know? But like 20 years from now, like, that's not guaranteed. It's hard to compare those two things. Same with Dave, you know, Dave. And I was thinking about this, you know, the other, or I was thinking on this on the way uh, driving back from my therapy appointment. Um, you know, it took Rachel, like, what? They were married for 16 years or something. They were together for 18, but married for 16, Dave and Rachel. It took her like 10 years to get him comfortable to go on camera and to be a part of the brand and to be there boo thing is already being put into the narrative so 10 years from now if he starts to become if he's still around which i highly doubt but if he is that's how long it took her to get the first guy to be involved so the fact that she's laying the foundation now Maybe she's trying to set it up so that over time she can get him to be a part of the, the branding too. I think that's my thought. But the fact that he's not on camera is not that amazing or shocking or like, wow, he's such a different person. Dave wasn't on it in the beginning either. That was my thoughts on the way here. Okay, let's continue. So last weekend was one of my best girlfriend's birthdays and Boo and I flew to Los Angeles from Austin for one night. It was one night only like dream girls to have dinner with her and the other girls. And I don't know if you guys have ever done this. I feel like I don't, boys don't do this in my, I don't think you do this, but girls, we do this. I fly from another state. I show up at the bar. My best girlfriend, Rosie, we are wearing the exact same outfit. I mean, not like the same, but. I mean, it's close. Black jacket, white shirt, jeans. I mean, that's it's literally probably the most standard outfit. And also the girl next to her, 
I shouldn't say girl. The woman next to her has basically the same thing. And the woman on the side has also the same. This is, this is uh, Beans. This is Rosie. And this is Sam, I believe. I don't know the friends as well as I know the, the main core group. Uh, this is the one that gave Rachel all of the uh, how not to be a racist books because she's the one that teaches on um, racism in the workplace and corporate world. This is the stylist, Rosie, and this, I believe, is, I think they're married, Ro or uh, Beans and Sam, I think. So that's the setup. Uh, okay, so they, she has, these are the core friends. These are the only friends that I've heard about, really, other than, like, the fake friends, like, when Rachel and Jenna, hat, or hat, hat maker, Jen Hatmaker and Jenna Kutcher got together and pretended they were besties. Don't see them anymore. They're gone. Uh, but that's who she's talking about. So just for, for context. Uh, there's photo evidence of it. The same thing. The jacket, the white shirt, the jeans with the exact boyfriend jeans with holes in them, the same shoes. It's so ridiculous. And I was like, this is how you know it's real. This is how you know the love is pure and real is when you show up. Part of it too is that Rosie dresses me for a lot of things. <laughs> So I definitely had in my head, I gotta come correct. I can't roll into Rosie's party. I had to really think about what she would approve of me wearing. I put it together, end up, I guess I picked correctly because she's wearing the exact same outfit. Also, I'm old. And you know how- She's 39, just for the record. I know I'm old. I cannot here in restaurants anymore. I can't hear. I don't get it. I feel like I am living in crazy town. Why are these restaurants so loud? We went, we had a team meeting. One of my favorite places in Austin is this great place on South Congress called Cafe No Se. Like so good, good for brunch, good for meetings. If you roll in there at some point, you'll probably see me and the team having a meeting. We go over there. I sit down. I get there a little bit before the kids, and I have my coffee, and I'm just, you know, thinking. And Is she talking about kids, like the kids, like her team? That's what I was trying to figure out the first time, like the kids, because she's like, I'm having a work meeting. And then she's like, I get there before the kids. Is she talking about, like, the people she's hired? Because it's probably not a good thing to call them kids if uh, you're talking about your people you hired on your team. Oh, thank you, Michelle Zeroni. Are you Madam Zeroni? Oh, however, it's Canadian dollars. So Dave has something to say about that. Um, it is 18 American dollars. Yeah, we only accept um, stinkings. 18 stinking dollars. Or American. That's Dave's rule. So sorry, I appreciate it, but... Uh, Try again next time. Just kidding. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so she's talking about her kids, a.k.a. maybe her team. Setting intentions. And I'm already like, I'm not going to be able to hear these kids talk. I, I can. Could you hear there? I'm so sorry. Let me go back because I don't want to like accuse her of something she hasn't done. But she's calling them kids. And I don't know if she's talking about her kids, but I thought she was saying that she was going to a meeting. So let me just replay and listen to it and not talk. Okay. At some point, you'll probably see me and the team having a meeting. We go over there. Oh, I go back in there. No say. Like, sorry. We went, we had a team meeting. One of my favorite places in Austin is this great place on South Congress called Cafe No Say. Like, so good, good for brunch, good for meetings. If you roll in there at some point, you'll probably see me and the team having a meeting. We go over there, I sit down, I get there a little bit before the kids and I have my coffee and I'm just, you know, thinking and setting intentions. The kids. And I'm already like. And he said, so Jack is the one behind the camera who I guess does exist because we saw his wrist one time. Um, power move. Is he saying that's a power move calling him a kid? He's a grown man. He's like our, my age, like 30, I'm assuming, unless he's 15, when which he's got a child labor law issue. No, he's an adult. What the hell is she calling them kids for? Because she's 39 and now she can just condescend everybody? It's frustrating. And then she's doubled down and says it twice. The kids, the kids. Like, oh, you're mama Rach now? I thought you are a big sis Rach. Mother Rachel. 
All of you are children. I'm not going to be able to hear these kids talk. I, I can. Could you hear there? Okay, it wasn't just me. Because they have the music, but then everyone's so loud. I don't understand. So they come in. They sit down with me. I said, y'all, we are just having brunch. We are not trying to have a team meeting right now. Because if you try and talk to me about our goals for podcasts or what Jack's editing, I am not going to be able to hear you. So we literally had a brunch, which was really nice, actually. We all just caught up. How's your life? What's happening in your world? And then afterwards, we went to a quieter location so we could have a real meeting. Um, but I can't hear. So at Rosie's birthday dinner, I woke up like I had tonsillitis, like I needed to have my throat removed. I had screamed. Oh, thank you, Ember A. Four ninety nine American. Dave approves, um, but uh, he wants you to know. I'm sorry that you don't have a job. That's a little low. I gotta raise that one up. I'm sorry that you don't have a job. Um, and Dave just also wants you to know. I am all about getting a free ride. <laughs> Me too, Dave. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Ember. Uh, okay, so I see a lot of people in the chat are saying, yeah, because Tony called her a kid. That's so right. I didn't even think about that. She's taking Tony Robbins' condescending behavior, and instead of recognizing it and going, man, maybe that was a mistake that I you know, invited him on my podcast to promote his uh, very extreme viewed book about medical trends or whatever the frick he was talking about, about how COVID's, you know, fat people's fault. Um, and there's a lot of that in the Dr. Amen podcast as well, just a heads up. There's a lot of like, uh, oh, it's because you're fat. That's why COVID, you know, happened. So be, be warned. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. And she, same thing that she did when she noticed that Tony Robbins doesn't have women on stage instead of recognizing that as, you know, this is someone I don't want to support because I'm all about women empowerment and blah, blah, blah. Instead she goes, I'm going to be the first woman to be on his stage. It's like, is that the lesson? Is that the, the best lesson you could have taken from that? And now Tony calls you a kid and calls you honey. And now you're going to treat the underlings under you the same way. Not a good look. Tim Wa. For three hours. Why is it so loud? Where are the restaurants where you can have a conversation? In fact, when Boo and I go on dates, you know how you can like be on open table or resi or whatever? Because everywhere you have to have a reservation now. I don't know what it's like in your town, but in Austin, Texas, in LA, in New York, like the places I go often, the days when you could walk into a restaurant and be like, do you have a table for two? Could we sit at the bar? That's gone. That's done. I'm trying to think of a movie where there's like a really mean receptionist in like Beverly Hills and someone walks in thinking that they're gonna just like walk in and have, that's what they act like when you walk in. They're like, <laughs> do you have a reservation? No? Okay, well, it's three and a half months before you can get a table here. And it's literally like 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. Going up on a Tuesday. What, what is this world we're living inside of? So I don't know how to... Why do they say inside of? It's so frustrating. What is this world we're living inside of? What does that mean? Inside of the world as opposed to what? In Mars? Like inside of the world we're living in? I don't, I don't understand the extra words inside of, outside of, inside of. Like Dave and Heidi now do it all the time. It's so weird. That's a side note. Uh, okay, so in LA and New York where I go to the fancy restaurants, they say you need a reservation. They don't know that I am motivational Mother Earth, Rachel. Oh, they don't know that my boyfriend is Sh no Sean Mendez. Oh, how dare they ask me for a reservation? I know she's trying to like relate to us as viewers as like, oh yeah, that sounds so uppity and like so you know, classes that they would make you have a reservation. It's like, I live in Florida. No one asked me for a reservation because I go to Chili's. <laughs> and uh, they don't care there. Also, drive throughs don't care. Also, most restaurants, other than the fanciest of the fancy, don't care. Here, at least. I don't live in a huge town. Semi-large, but not the biggest. Not in New York City or a Austin, Texas. No, I live in about the size of Austin, Texas. So, I mean, 
I think she's just going to like these expensive places in my thoughts. And Austin is very touristy too. So, you know, it's probably busy all the time, but let me know if I'm wrong about that. Cause I not, I've not experienced what she's experienced in this moment. How to get a table. And I also don't understand where I can hear. But when I do make a reservation on one of those apps, every single time I write in the box, like, do you have any comments, anything we should know? I'm like, yes, I'm allergic to walnuts and also please stick us somewhere where we can hear. We are old, put us by, put us in a, in a storage closet, put us somewhere we can hear each other talk. I am not trying to be here for the ambient music. Maybe I need to start putting that like, cotton balls in my ears. Hold up. Didn't she just say like two weeks ago that she loves going out for live music and she gave the 70 year old woman a, a moment of relevance by buying her a shot and this is her favorite place and she just loves going out to party. And now she's like, I'm so old. I just want to sit at home and, and bake cookies for my children. Sasha Wilt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Anti anti toxic positivity. That's what we're about here. Uh, and Dave is all about. I am all about getting a free ride. <sighs> Dave. Unfollow me. That will never get old. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So she's changed her tune very much from like, I find joy in going out with my boyfriend and listening to music and partying and drinking shots. Now she's like, I just want to be home well she's not saying she wants to be home she just wants to be in a quiet restaurant it's like okay that's you could just do that at home doordash it's quiet at home i don't know seems like a first world problem to me maybe i don't know what i'm supposed to do i don't know where i'm supposed to go but i can't hear jeffrey just tried to chase a bird <laughs> that bird is not doing anything to you jeffrey my house is like a sanctuary for birds. Uh, literally, you can't see on every tree in my backyard. The, in the front, there's bird feeders everywhere because Boo loves birds. <laughs> loves them. I thought I liked birds. This man loves them. Have I ever told you about his... He's got cameras. You would think this man's a paparazzi. He's got like a telephoto... More than one. What's that photo, telephoto lens for? The Cardinals. Blue Jays, you never have met a human in your life that gets as excited as a, a, a bird, right? Any bird just fluttering by. He has an app on his phone. He didn't share this with me right away, okay? <laughs> this was not revealed on the first date. This was revealed about three months ago. So nine months into our relationship, I discover this man has an app on his phone called Chirpomatic. What's that, Jack? Oh, if you're just sitting in the backyard, perhaps, and you hear a chirp, but you're not sure which bird it comes from, you just hold it up. And then it's like, caca, that's a Western Blue Jay. You know, this is something that I would find myself doing back in my day when I was not old like Rachel. I'm 30, so, you know, I guess I'm still young. <laughs> um, you know, not appreciating hobbies, not thinking that having something outside of work is important because I was you know, indoctrinated into the toxic positivity culture, into the hustle culture, into every moment of your day needs to be dedicated to producing something that's gonna get you to the next level of your life. And any moment of rest and relaxation is a moment spent badly and going to end up in my demise and homelessness. That was the mentality I had for a lot of years, most, actually most of my life. Uh, if you look at the, you know, adult life, you know, this is a me kind of being more balanced and understanding of like, oh, this is all a scam is recent, uh, in the grand scheme of things. So when I, f you know, hear her talk, that's, just, this is how I would think like she's saying it in a, in a, again, condescending way where she's talking about his little lame hobby that my, you know, nerdy boyfriend, uh, as it says in the title, nerdy boyfriend has, how is this? that bad in the terms of first of all nerdy i don't know if it's nerdy it's in you know he's interested in birds okay that's a fairly good hobby compared to some of the hobbies that could involve you know risk or promiscuity or something there's lots of hobbies you could have that are like you know 
worse for a relationship. This is pretty tame. It's pretty safe. It's interesting. It's nature related, which she claims to care about all of a sudden. So why talk about it in such a negative tone? It's because she doesn't believe that it should be there. I think she doesn't believe in hobbies because what hobbies does she have? You know, and I don't, I don't think it's, you know, I, I, it's sort of embarrassing almost. And I feel embarrassed sometimes. I didn't have hobbies. I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know what to do other than like, I listen to motivational podcasts and exercise and go to work and go to sleep. That was, and drink heavily, which is also something she says she does. So that was my life. But as an evolved person, as she claims to be like, oh, I'm evolved. I've changed. I'm been da da da. Like, I think you would know that hobbies and having something you're interested in outside of working and making money and chasing success would be good for you. So whatever it is, celebrate it and appreciate it, not shit on it on your own money making, not even a podcast, what is this? YouTube channel, whatever she's doing this for. I don't know why, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, keeping her relevant, I guess, or in the conversation. But uh, yeah, I, I think this is a totally cool thing that he's doing and not something that she should be <laughs> it's so stupid. He has a stupid app and a stupid camera. It's like, just give the guy a break. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he is as a person. I don't know. He could be a jerk too. Who knows? But even so, regardless of that, you should still respect he's got something good going for him. Oh, thank you, Starry Nights. Uh, we have considered that Jack isn't real, uh, but we saw his wrist one time. So Jack, Jack, Jack. And I did see an Instagram that seemed related to him and he's got a LinkedIn. So, you know, she's got a pretty good, she's just doing this all by herself. She's doing pretty good. Uh, but yes, we have considered that. Thank you. You are now my boo thing. Okay. That's my soliloquy about, uh, hobbies and why we should all have them because they're very important. Despite what every stupid Rachel Hollis like guru will tell you, uh, let's continue. Thank you. Like he has this thing. I don't know what this is called, but it's like where you spot birds and it's like, so if you were here and it'd be like, oh my God, that's a blue crested Oriole or something. Those should not be in this part of the, of the country this time of year. And they're like, he would always go on this app and I thought he was going on there so he could like look, just like see or something. No, no, it's like a, imagine like a Facebook, but just for people who follow birds. And he's got like 150 entries. Like he's seen these, cause he travels all over the world. So it'd be like, oh, I saw a purple fluted macaw in Milwaukee. I had no idea, okay? This is the beautiful cherub that I am in love with. So all over the, the ha all over the yard, there's just bird, 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 bird. <laughs> all the bird feeders, lots of pictures, lots of moments, what's chirping, what's happening. Jeffrey just tried to chase off a cardinal, which is what reminded me that yesterday we're having happy hour on the back patio. And you know, there's all sorts of birds. That's her hobby, happy hour, you know, whatever. The spring no comment. and um, the birds are coming out. It's really exciting. <sighs> I shouldn't even tell the story. It's really upsetting. We're sitting back there and there were blue jays. <laughs> That's what she said before she outed her whole child's, uh, you know, embarrassing love story. She's like, I shouldn't say this in the next second. Anyway, so then I did this. It's like, oh my God. Don't even put that in there though. Just cut that part out because it makes it seem like, oh, she has a, a, a sip of empathy in her cup and then she just throws it out and says, now I'm going to be thirsty <laughs> and just tells the story anyways. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> All right. Jays. scrub jays specifically a scrub jay if i'm saying this right this is actually something i know from my dad not from boo yeah a scrub jay is it's a lot bigger than the other birds and so there were a pair of scrub jays they were in the backyard they were getting worms and then all here we have wrens and cardinals and there's like two people who like birds too who are like pumped about all the birds we have in our backyard and a titmouse have you ever seen a titmouse they're so cute so we have all these birds that are feeding and then a blue jay flies down. A, a scrub jay, it's a lot bigger than the little birds that are feeding. And so I think they thought it was a bird of prey. So they thought it was a hawk or they thought it was something. And all of these birds, there's probably 50 birds in the backyard, they all flee. I don't want no scrub. And they're just like, in a moment of panic, they flee. And a cardinal, a, a female cardinal, 
in her fight or flight panic flies as fast as she can into the window and I'm, it was like the worst because it was just if you think this story is random and that has something to do with, you know, her boyfriend's weird hobby, she claims, and then it goes into like this bird I was drinking on the patio and I saw this. Oh no, it gets wrapped up into a life lesson. So just, just FYI, that is coming very shortly that um, you can learn from this scrub jay's death. Once again, we're back to uh, some being dying in front of Rachel, like the guy, this is a, from like a throwback episode of her podcast. She allegedly witnessed someone at the park die. And she's like, this is a lesson for me <laughs> to recognize how great my life is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole aside thing that I don't think actually happened, but whatever. That's about what this is going to be. But instead of a real person, now she's testing the story out as a bird. So just a uh, fair warning. I didn't want you to get bored and click away and not realize that this story has a deeper meaning coming up very shortly. She's dead. <laughs> and he's like so sad. And I'm crying because I've just witnessed this bird die. And also because I'm me, I'm like, what does this mean? Why did we see this? Like this cycle of life. And then also like I'm crying about this cardinal and he goes and picks it up and he's just like so sad for this bird. We're such losers. This is why we can't hear because we shouldn't be out in public. And what? Like, I don't get this either. Like, oh, he cares about a bird. We're such losers. I think every empathetic human being cares about something dying and would be upset about it. It's not loser. Who would not be? Tony Robbins? Okay, he's not the standard that you should hold yourself to. If a bird died in front of Tony Robbins, he'd be like, that's great. Anyways, come to my, come to my conference. Birds are, birds are, you know, representative of my flight of success. That's mean. Well, he's, whatever. He's mean. He's a jerk. He called her a kid. I can get away with it, right? Anyways, um, <laughs> back to the program. And then, like, two seconds later, like, all the other birds were back. And I was like, what does this mean? Like, this poor thing panicked and in her panic died. And then it didn't even matter. And I know that this sounds like so stupid because I feel like only I would be lame enough to try and find meaning in this moment, but it made me so sad. And when things make me sad, I have to find meaning in them. And I thought there is a lesson in this moment, right? That this, in her panic, she did something that made it so much worse than it actually was. And if she had just hesitated even a moment if she had taken a breath and I know she's a bird like she's not wired to slow down and take a breath and see what's really how do we know this bird is a she hashtag Rachel genders birds cancel her what if that was the thing that took her down <laughs> she misgendered the bird it was actually a male scrub jay or whatever. Is we still talking about scrub jays? I'm so far gone from like what the actual point of this was that I've, I've forgotten. I think this is the analogy, the symbolism of she went on, she was already so upset because her hormones were all over the place because she didn't get the chocolate that she needed for the day to relax as woman, as woman we are. Uh, and so she made the TikTok about the woman cleaning her toilets twice a week and that she just panicked. That was it. She panicked, that's all. She's just like this bird. She's relatable to the bird. That's what I think this story represents. It ain't doing it for me. It ain't working for me, but you know, she tries. She throws stuff out there and see what people react to. It's not this one. ...going on, but we are. We have a higher consciousness. We have a higher train of thought. And I think that Sometimes when we're in a panic state or when an anxious state or when we've been inside of a pandemic for two years and now we're watching war and atrocities and all of these things, it's very easy to exist in the state where you're constantly in fight or flight, where your nervous system is wired to move and to jump and to react instead of to slow down and see what's really going on. So that is what I took away from that yesterday beyond it being very sad.
was just this reminder to slow down and see what is actually going on. Would it be crazy if she's like, so then I just came, I, I thrifted the cardinal. Okay, I see it was a cardinal, so I'm sorry. I got I got lost. I thought we were still on scrub jays. Uh, I took the cardinal and made it into this thrifted hat. Here's a feather that I plucked from its body. <laughs> That's what she seems to be like thinking everyone else does when an animal dies in front of them, that we're all just heartless except for her and her boothing. It's like, come on. Is that what you really think or are you just like out of touch? Anyways, I laughed at that comment. I don't, that's, I don't think that's what you meant, but that's what I read it and I was like, oh my God, wouldn't that be weird if she took it and made it into a bird, bird hat? Anyways. Because if she had slowed down, if you slow down, I think you will find that it's never as bad as you think that it is. Boo. Come on. I just told the story about the cardinal. Oh, I know. So no, I didn't cry this time. Did I tell you about having to wash Jeffrey's butt? And we're done with that story. Uh, that was the, the, the grand entrance of Boo. Didn't it sound like she's like, come here, come here, like to the dog. And that's why the dog came, Jeffrey came, because um, she was like speaking to him as if he was like a, a, like a pet. I mean, maybe it got confused in the edit. I, I also don't know why they would leave that in other than to show he's real, he exists, he lives in my house. Uh, because that provided no value to the story and also was a weird transition. So he must have been told or knew that Rachel would like that. I'm talking about he, Jack, the uh, videographer, editor. Jack, Jack. Jack. Um, to leave that part in. And he also doesn't sound British. I didn't hear a thick accent. So maybe he's like, he, I, maybe he doesn't have one. Maybe I've been mis-accenting him this whole time. He's, he's English though, guys. In case you didn't know, he's English. She's let us know 15,000 times. I miss it. Okay, this is kind of a gross story. I'm not gonna really talk through it so we can kind of get through it because it's like pointless, but shows like, again, that talks about her boyfriend and how the dog sucks and she has to do relatable things. That's this summary of this story. <laughs> My ongoing saga, I don't have four kids. I have five kids and this is one of them, except it's like raising a 90 year old man who doesn't like you. It was just a random morning. I went to let him out and it just so happened he came back inside and I realized He's got poop all over his butt. Okay, sometimes it just doesn't come out all the way. And it, you know, and then you're like trying to help. You ever had to try and help a dog get, you know what? Like the things we do for these creatures, he's got poop all over his butt and it's like messy. And half my furniture's white or cream colored and I'm not about to let this dog go put his butt, cause he's allowed on all the furniture, Oh, put his dirty butt on my sofa. Boo is a, a, like around the kids were at school and Boo was like, I don't know. He's doing Thank you, Bunny. Wow, Australian. Uh, we don't accept that here, but I'll take it anyways. Um, we only accept. It is 18 American dollars. Um, and if you switch it to American, I will actually do something obscene for you. I'm just kidding. Thank you, Bunny, and thank you very much for your message. I appreciate that a lot. I, I do appreciate you. All right, continue. I have nothing to say about this dumb story, <laughs> so I'm just gonna let it play. Doing something, and he wasn't like with me, so I was by myself, and I'm just like, okay, whatever. I'm gonna get his, <laughs> I'm gonna get like a wet paper towel, and I'm gonna do some scrubbing. Only when I did that, it somehow made it worse. It became more of a situation. Now I'm like, I need another adult. So I had to keep him outside and I was like, baby, I am so sorry. I need you to help me wash the dog's butthole. It's a situation, and he's just like, oh my God. The amount of times this man is like, he managed to be single at 43 years old. When I met him, he was 43 years old. He had never been married. He had never had kids and how somehow finds himself in this chaotic world taking care of this dog who does not love 
43 and somehow managed to stay single. Yes, uh, I'm sure that was by sheer luck that he just waited 43 years for Rachel Hollis. Not that he is secretly dating other people on the side. I don't know that for sure. Who's to say? But uh, yeah, it does seem a little interesting that he would want a uh, piecemeal family or what is that the word for it? Not piecemeal. Like uh, put like, like, what do you say when you, you go into a relationship, they already have the family. It's like you just enter into the family. I don't know. Made for you family. <laughs> made for more family. Made already. I, I thought he was older, to be quite honest. 43. I thought he was like 53. Um, I don't know why. I just thought that. I haven't seen many photos of him, only a couple on his own Instagram. I thought he was much older. The way she speaks about him is that he's like this wise sage. So maybe that was part of my thought, thinking. I was like, oh, he must be older. Um, it's not a red flag in particular that he's, you know, oh, she's saying this, but it's interesting. It's like, yeah, why, why didn't you have a relationship before? Maybe he doesn't want kids and a wife. Maybe she just doesn't know that yet. Ooh him back and these four kids and cooking dinner and doing the whole thing and now he's got to wash the dog's butthole where's bobby keep the extra diapers and it's like he's like okay what is the plan i'm like the plan is we gotta we gotta put him in the sink because it's gonna take more it's it's gonna take more than a than a paper towel i put on rubber gloves because i'm about to do the lord's work up in here I put on rubber gloves, I run a, like a lukewarm bath in the sink, put on rubber gloves, and he's the one in charge of keeping him calm, giving him treats, keeping him calm, while I'm, you know, going to town on the undercarriage and wondering what has become of my life. It is one thing when you gotta wipe your kids' butts, but I gotta take care of this schnauzer, I gotta, no, no. Why don't things ever happen when the person who should be taking care of it is there. For instance, why weren't my teenage son's home? My teenage son who asked me for this dog for four years, where's he when the dog's butthole needs to be cleaned? Like this can't happen when Sawyer's home from school, that he can learn a real life lesson about what it means to care for another being? My son. Well, he can't learn the lesson if you haven't learned it first, Rachel. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like a nothing story. Like, this is nothing. This is happens every day. My cat throws up lizards on the daily. I love to clean it up because she's my baby and I love her. Get over it. She doesn't like Jeffrey. We know she, she doesn't like Jeffrey. Jeffrey is like Dave's dog, I guess, is what it seems like. And now that he's MIA or wherever he's at, you know, she's said multiple times that, oh, I have to take responsibility for Jeffrey now because she's got the kids. So therefore she has Jeffrey. She's complained about him in every episode, how boring this dog is, how he doesn't, the dog doesn't love her back and how much responsibility it is. It's like, we get it. Dave's not in the picture right now. You have to take care of the dog. Sorry. Have never one time, not once. Have they talked to their father about sex? Okay, we switched topics. Let's go back. This is a Dave slander here. Yeah. Not Okay, let's play this. This is about Dave being irresponsible and not talking to his sons about sex. So I think that's an overshare for both the teens and dad. As much as I don't care for Dave's lessons, I think what he does off camera should be his own privacy. If he's not out with it, coming out with it on his own, then I don't think it should be fair to judge necessarily. Does that make sense, I guess? The fact that Rachel's putting it out there for everyone to consume, okay, that's her burden to bear. But the fact that he's not telling people, don't talk to your kids about not having sex, then I can't really blame him for it. Because maybe he is, but he's doing it privately. And she, I don't know, just seems like, just be quiet. Why is this, why is this needed to know information for your audience? Sons have never one time, not once, have they talked to their father about sex. Do you know how many conversations I've had with these teenage boys about sex? 10,000, 10,000 conversations. At, first, at the beginning, it used to make me like super embarrassed or like giggle or whatever. Now I'm just like, you know, 
because they hear things and I don't want them to get misinformation. So they'll be like, what's, what's this position mean? I'm like, oh my word. Okay, here's what it means. And then they're mortified. They die 10,000 deaths. And then, you know, two months later, they come back with another question. What? <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> Are positions part of sex education? Because as much as I think we need to be more open and honest about sex education, I don't think I ever want to know from my mother or any family member or adult when I'm 15 about different positions. Personal, personal choice on my end. I think the rest of it's very important. Safety, you know, emotional relationships, what they mean, all that stuff. 100% on board. Positions, maybe you should go on the internet for that or or learn it as time goes on <laughs> thoughts we're i know talk to your dad about that bro and they're like it's embarrassing i'm like what doing the lord's work over here washing buttholes sex education do you ever think about now that you're like an adult you're a grown up i assume you're a grown up or maybe you are a teenager watching this has anyone ever one time in school gotten sex ed and it been helpful. As far as I know, every sex education class is just like you giggling with your friends at like the word ovaries or whatever, or like testes. Uh, I mean, my sex education was like an eighth grade. I thought it was a little heavy on the fear factor. Personally, I thought it was very geared towards being afraid, which I was still am sometimes of like all the horrible things that you can get from having sex with the wrong person. Like they would show us, we had a slideshow. Maybe this is a Florida thing. We had a slideshow of like every STD, like graphic details of what it looks like when you have an STD. I was terrified. I mean, it worked. I guess like the program was to make you scared um, and that worked. So, but yeah, I think, yeah, sex ed probably isn't, uh, is, isn't all encompassing. They're not talking about positions. <laughs> so if that's what she wants from sex ed class, uh, they ain't talking about that, at least in my experience. Oh, my Lord. The laughter we had about the word testes. Calm down, baby Rachel. You are not that cool. It is, it is a bummer that there is actual classes that are supposed to teach us about our bodies or how things work. And I am a 39-year-old woman still reading books about, like, what my hormones do. Why didn't anyone teach me that in school? Jack, this is a thing that I just learned. I am 39. I just read this in a book. Literally three weeks. Okay, here, here we go. This is going to be talking about hormones again. This is the buildup into, like, my hormones made me worse. But when my hormones are perfect, I'm perfect. Like, that's her whole thing, her whole shtick. Um, I think the reason, and I don't think she's asking this genuinely. She's just setting up her own garbage. But genuinely, genuinely... Uh, they don't teach hormones in school because it's a very nuanced thing. And there is no like, this will happen if this, like hormones are not, I'm sure they're understood by, you know, science and doctors and studies, but like, you can't just give out advice in a classroom setting and say, this is what happens when X, Y, Z, this is what it, 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 you, everyone's different. It's not a one size fits all lesson that you can teach about hormones as, as far as I know. So yeah, that's why. And she's like, oh, I'll just let it play for a second. Weeks ago. The clitoris. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go there. Do you know that the clitoris is a muscle that goes, it's huge. Everyone thinks it's this little tiny thing. It's a muscle that goes throughout your whole vulva. Do you know when they figured that out? 1997, which would explain a lot, all right? There's a lot of re... In 1997, a doctor discovered that a woman's clit is not a tiny little... It's a huge muscle that goes throughout her vulva. I kind of want to soundbite that, but I'm probably going to get demonetized immediately. <laughs> it's just so weird to hear her talking about this. I don't know. Maybe I'm immature. But it's like, what's the point? Like, okay, so what? It's, I didn't... I looked this up after I, I watched this yesterday, and I was like, oh... Okay, she's right. I didn't know that. I don't know how to apply the knowledge. Nobody knew that information. 
And I'm not saying that you're going to go to eighth grade and your your eighth grade PE teacher. Why they always get the PE teacher who really only wanted to coach volleyball? That's the one who's teaching us about sex ed. I'm not saying that he's going to be the one that explains this to us. But if there's something like that in our, how about this, Jack? Is anyone ever confused about the balls, the penis? Anyone confused about? No, because we know all the things about men, not nearly enough about women. I don't know how I got on this stand. I don't know anything about balls or, or testes, for the record. <laughs> I know not enough, probably, about both anatomies. But I'm just saying we are misinformed. Specifically, I freaking love teachers. I am so grateful for teachers. Y'all are doing, you are actually doing the Lord's work. But the fact that I am going to be 40 next year and I am educating myself right now about things that I should have known about my body when I was 12 or 13 makes me really sad. And the good news is I am learning this stuff because I want my daughter, I want her as the next generation to never be confused. So I just did a podcast episode with Kristen, who's a friend of the show, she's been on before, and we had a second conversation about hormones, how to sync and control your cycle, how to eat and align your nutrition with what's going on in your body. It's just all this continuous. See, this is where I have the problem. Like, if you want to learn about your body, hormones, whatever, in a general sense, you know, great, more power to you. What I have the problem with is now you're bringing in an expert, which I don't know this person in particular, so maybe they could be some sort of medical expert. But it, a lot of times, based on what she's done in the past, bring on people who you know, especially lately are a little bit more like, I'm a medium, I'm an energy healer, like things that you don't go to school for, you go to a weekend seminar for to get certified in these things. That's where I start to have an issue where you're saying like, oh, this is a problem that we don't have better education in schools. They can't teach this pseudoscience to our kids. It's like, yeah, I'm glad that they don't teach pseudoscience to children. Like, oh, sinking your your food with your cycle and, and I'm sure there's some moon stuff in there. I would, you know, beg to guess that there's some like, oh, moon ritual involved. And that's where I go. That's not concrete science. You know, she talks a lot about uh, hormone balancing. If you're estrogen dominant or whatever dominant, testosterone dominant, I looked it up and there, there seems to be debate about it. There's not, a, again, a concrete, like this is what this means. It could mean that, but sometimes these pseudoscience people pick up on a trend or pick up on something that's kind of like, you know, like uh, Epstein Barr, like the medical medium. He's decided like that's caused everything. Every ailment that you have is caused by Epstein Barr. It's like maybe, but it seems unlikely given all the other data. And like same thing with her. It's like, oh, everything in my life is dependent on my hormones. It's like maybe, but you're only listening to one person's advice and they're also getting a benefit out of, you know, making you think that you have to go to them for all of your health advice. So that's where I draw the line. It's like education's great, but don't educate yourself with a pseudoscientist or you know a person, a coach, a period coach. Find someone who's got some credentials, please. That's my two cents. Continuing education about getting to know ourselves better, and you can watch because we actually have a video of our original conversation or listen in to the latest podcast episode to maybe start an education that you didn't get when you were younger, but that you definitely need now. The answer, I think, to all of this is for us to have knowledge. And it's a bummer that we didn't get the knowledge when we were little, but there's a whole new generation that's coming up. And I don't want our daughters, or even if you're a teenager and you're watching this, I don't want these generations to think that there's something wrong with them or to be misinformed about what their body does or to think that having a period is ugly or dirty or wrong or shameful or gross, it's a natural process inside of you. And uh, you guys should definitely listen into that episode to learn more. So here on the show, we love to highlight our STJ dream catcher. We're almost at the end. So that's the hormone conversation. Maybe we can watch that at a later date, the hormone, because I think that's going to be a big part of her next narrative to release herself from any uh, burden of feeling like she did something wrong or was canceled. It was just hormones. God, I wasn't educated as a child, but now I'm educated. So no longer need to be mad at me. 
is my thoughts. Uh, <laughs> this one, okay, this one could be real. This S STJ Dreamcatcher, because uh, the way that they edited it was very odd. Those are members of our Start Today community who have been working towards a goal. So if you're not familiar with the Start Today journal, uh, it's a product that I invented a few years I ago. Invented a you journal. do not have to buy it. You can totally do this in any notebook you have laying around. I invented writing, guys. But essentially, the idea is that every day you start with gratitude. You write down five things you're grateful for and then 10 dreams that you're going to make come true. So it's a daily practice of focusing. It's like a vision board in journal form. Well, there are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who have a Start Today journal, and they do this practice. And when you achieve one of the dreams on your top 10 list, we call that a dream catcher, the STJ dream catchers. And we're really lucky in that members of our community send us videos and tell us the thing that they have achieved. And this is this week conversation so check out this amazing story and congratulations to this week's dream catcher one goal I have been able to achieve this year by writing it out every single day was I have doubled the amount of money I have in my savings account writing that out every single day I was able to achieve it which I feel fortunate especially in this time we're in right now but I even surpassed it by tripling it all right, I love, love, love hearing about you achieving your goals. And I love the reminder that real people can do really cool things. So please, 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 if you are a dream catcher and you have a story to share, take a video, put it on social, tag start today, use this hashtag or send it to this email address. And when we select you to be featured here on the show, we're gonna send you a fabulous prize pack filled with some of the stuff from our office. We've got some of our Start Today notebooks, which are so cute. We've got... This is liquidating the items that they had in their office because she doesn't, well, allegedly no longer owns her office space, if she ever did, or they don't have an office space anymore because the brand is kaputs. So they have all this stuff to give away. Um, that was basically it. Of that. Hats. Oops, she's giving away hats and she's like, you don't know which one you're going to get because we're just going to send you whatever. So send us your video. I just thought that video editing was a little weird. Like they cut it off. Like she start, like they started it like she was already starting her thought. And then they cut it off before she finished her thought. The other ones got like a full two minute spread where they talk, you know, the girl with the laundry behind her, the woman with the laundry basket behind her overflowing. She got like a full three minutes talking about her goals. So this person got like 20 seconds and didn't go into any details at all, except that she tripled her savings account, which good for her. That's awesome. How did you do it? We'll never know because the video got cut off. Um, all right, so that was Rach Talk, the most recent one. Uh, what'd you think? Very enlightening? Not really. I see some of the debate too about the hormone thing. I think that's good that people are, you know, going back and forth. And I think there is a lot to say about women's, uh, you know, women's health not being considered in trials and that sort of thing. There's definitely a lot to say. However, I don't think that's what she was saying. And that's where I have the issue with it because there is a lot of, of you know, I don't think the medical field is, or science in general, anything is, uh, you know, oh my God, 1000%, amazing, no, no notes. I don't think that, but I don't think the solution is, you know, I don't think psychology, the industry, therapy, mental health industry is amazing either a lot of work to be done, but I don't think the solution is self-help. Uh, same thing with this, like, okay, because school, you know, resources are low or education on medical stuff is low, we should now believe in medical psychics or like Tony Robbins books as our replacement for, our, our, you know, a better system. Uh, so that's where I have the issue. So no, no, just for the record, I have nothing against, you know, making changes in the medical system or any system really. Uh, but the solution I don't believe is listening to Rachel Hollis. <laughs> Tell me stuff. All right, so let's now go to the uh, Rise podcast. Oh, sorry, the Rachel Hollis podcast. Was it, oh, no, it was called Deus back in the Deus. <laughs> uh, we're gonna listen to better, better, all caps. Better. I'm better than you after a breakup, uh, which I think means she's better than Dave. <laughs> she came out better than Dave did in the relationship. And in some ways she did. And in some ways she absolutely did not. I think they both came out equally bad. 
And I, if anything, I kind of blame her a little bit more because she was the one who had the brand and was selling the brand before he did. So she's more guilty of propping up how great the relationship was than he is. But he doesn't make it very easy because he's not, he doesn't come across as such a good guy. So, uh, yeah. And again, she's playing dumb and acting like, I have no idea why the last podcast on, you know, relationships, red flags in relationships would do so well. I have just no idea. She also wonders, what happened to dinosaurs? So she's got lots of questions, no answers. Uh, but I'm sure we'll be guided by her, by the, what do they call it? The ether? My guardian angels, my spirit guides. Okay, so they're going to guide us through this conversation. So let's begin episode 265, better after a breakup. I guess after. Let me start to do it again. Better after a breakup. Nicole, whether you chose the breakup or... This is how to become better because if you are going to have to walk through something as hard, I don't care how long you've been with someone, a breakup is difficult. Whether you chose the breakup or someone else broke up with you, it can be exhausting. It can be debilitating. There can be anger, sadness, fear, like so many negative emotions. And if you're going to have to walk through that hell, then you better come out the other side a better person. Hi, I'm Rachel Hollis, and this is my podcast. I spend so many hours of every single week reading and listening to podcasts and watching YouTube videos and trying to find out as much as I can about the world around me. And that's what we do on this show. We talk about everything, life and how to be an entrepreneur. What happened to dinosaurs? What's the best recipe for fried chicken? What's the best plan for intermittent fasting? What's going on with our inner child? How's therapy working out for you? Whatever it is my guests are into, I want to unpack it so that we can all understand. These are conversations. This is information for the curious. This is the Rachel Hollis Podcast. Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Well, I suppose you're listening to this on who knows what day of the week, but it's a Monday morning for me. And I was actually going to go work in one of my favorite coffee shops this morning because it's the first like sunny warmer. And when I say warm, I mean like it'll be 60 today instead of 30, which is really exciting. And I was going to go work in a coffee shop. And then I just got inspired to do a podcast. I had uh, sort of mapped this one out last week. And then this morning I woke up and I was like, you know what? Today's a good day. I'm going to do that podcast. So here we are. And it's a really special day for our family because today my daughter, Noah, who's my youngest, turns five. And for any of you so Noah turning five, I think happened in February. So these podcasts and Rage Talk episodes must be sort of old. And I guess that seems obvious, but we're almost like a month behind in real time. So you never really know what's going on because, yeah, she turned five and this is when she's recording this. This just came out last week. She's talking about the Dr. Amen and she's talking about all this stuff. Like it's all over the place kind of time-wise. So, you know, by the time she records something by the time we actually listen to it she might be on a totally different tangent by then so i thought that was interesting that she's telling you this is february but it's march 22nd or mamas or daddies it's just it really it really does go so fast like on the one hand five years feels like a lifetime and on the other hand it feels like it was yesterday and noah's birth was so special because she's adopted and When we tell the story to her of the day that she was born, it starts with her dad and I getting on a plane, very nervous, and going to Nebraska to be with her first mom while she labored. And when Noah was born, we were there. I was holding her, her first mom's leg as she pushed her into the world, and I got to cut Noah's cord, and it just is such a special day. So she went to school today with like full unicorn tutu dress, just every unicorn sparkly situation she could find in her room. She was rocking today, which I love. And we're doing a big family dinner for her later. We're going to the trampoline park. It's a big day around here. And per Noah's request, we are all wearing pajamas to dinner. And we're all going to have bows and side ponies like Jojo Siwa, who... 
I don't know if any of your kids ever got into something that you did not, I did not sanction JoJo Siwa. I've never turned that on in my house. Like I, not, nothing against JoJo Siwa. In fact, after she came out, I was like, all right, I love you. Um, but it's just, if you've ever seen it, it's very intense. It's very colorful. It's loud. It's just, you know, it's a lot. So I would never really, that's like actively giving your child a toy that makes really obnoxious music for Christmas. I wouldn't introduce that. I didn't introduce JoJo, but she somehow discovered her a couple years ago and just has never stopped in her massive love for this person. So we're having a little JoJo Siwa unicorn rainbow extravaganza tonight, and it's pretty exciting. So I am uh, have gotten myself to a place in my work, which is just really life-giving. I'll, I'll do a podcast about this when I just have a bit more experience with it, but have really I want to bring up too so she's going to talk about the breakup and all that you know this is like the setup I guess just to catch you up on what's going on in my life um so Noah's five she just said that she's turning five just turned five uh she's going to talk about for like seven years me and Dave were fighting and I I you know I knew that something was wrong for five to seven years it's like so you went through the adoption knowing, and I've said this before, this is not new information, but it, it's worth pointing out again, how can you adopt a, a child in good faith when you're, if she was, which I don't think she was, but she claims she was seriously considering breaking up with him for this many years or having serious issues in which the kids now need to be protected from it. How can you need to protect your current children from the father's actions or behavior, but then you're going to bring in a new child into the world by choice, not like, oh, I got pregnant and, you know, it happened, but like adopt, you have to, you know, give that first mother, as she calls it, like a good reason I would imagine as to why you're the family to go with. And it just seems like there are two narratives going on. It's interesting that she would bring up the adoption story in this podcast specifically. Very odd gotten myself to a place in work where I buckle down and knock out my workload in maybe two hours, maybe three, and then just do whatever I want for the rest of the day. It's pretty crazy. And I know that I am really freaking lucky to get to do that because I own my company. But I found myself, and I don't know if any of you have found yourself in switching and working from home how much faster you get stuff done. Like if you're not being pulled into meetings, if nobody's coming into your office, and I know that lots of you are back in the office, back at work, so you don't have this luxury. I'm super hyper aware of that. But for those of you who do work from home like I do, it's definitely worth checking out things like Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss and um, different bloggers and different people who kind of speak to this idea of really honing in, batching your work and then having the rest of the time to pursue other things. So it's funny, in the book, The 4-Hour Work Week, he talks about how in order to actually pull this off, you have to have a plan for what you'll fill the remaining time with. So my first step was like, I'm gonna figure out how to get my work condensed, which I did. It took me a couple of months, but I figured it out. And then, and by the way, that was just by like really focusing on what was essential, stripping away anything that wasn't. I, I will do a podcast. This is actually a big... The fact that she still does rage talk and she has claimed to strip away anything that's unnecessary and just really, you know, buckle down in her business. Uh, I'm confused. What business are you like? She gets like maybe on the high end, like 10,000 views on YouTube. I guess she uses it as podcast episodes, but still, thank you for subscribing, Mariana. Um, but that's what you leave, like trying to hawk start today journals and doing the podcast that's the best that's the cream of the crop what you've you've kept odd to me also i wanted to say hi camelia i see you in the comments welcome welcome sorry that i got our days confused this is why i was like uh shoot i got our our meeting time wrong so i, I apologize to camelia personally and publicly uh for doing this live instead of us meeting which we were supposed to <laughs> sorry Anyways, back to the show, and I'm also going to play it. I'm going to grab a drink really quickly, but I already have listened to this, so uh, I, I, I've memorized it by, by memory. No, I haven't. Okay, bye. Changing things. So I figured that piece out. Then he says what a lot of people end up doing is when they don't know what to fill the extra time with, rather than wanting to feel like they're like being a slacker, they just sort of accidentally start doing more work. Like they kind of create busy work, and I definitely – accidentally did that. So I'm now in the phase where I'm really actively trying to put things in those hours that are the life-giving pursuits that I've wanted to 
try and have for years. You've probably heard me, if you've been with me for a while, you've heard me talk about, you know, trabajando mi español para oof, cinco años. Um, and I just never go to the next level with Spanish. And I really want to. All of that to say that I am getting my work done this morning so that the rest of my day is devoted to setting up, like really decorating the house. I just want it to feel so special for her for her fifth birthday. And I'm coming in hot with this podcast, which has, as usual, nothing to do with the intro that I just talked to you all about. I did an episode recently of the podcast that was so wildly popular and successful that I, I was shocked. I really, truly shocked. And I didn't even know, I don't really check my numbers. It just says, I don't review anything that I put out into the world. I make content and put it out and hope that, you know, somebody it gets help from it, but I don't. Uh, as someone who claims to give advice to entrepreneurs, this is probably the worst advice you can give putting your work out there and not reading the comments, putting your work out there and not checking the analytics. First of all, it's bullshit and I don't believe her. But second of all, don't take that advice. You need to know what your audience wants. What do you do? If you want to create just to create something, don't make it a business, make it a hobby and do whatever you want to do. But if you're trying to make a living or trying to serve as they all call themselves, we're servant leaders. We're serving our community of whatever. How can you not want to know what they need? How can you not ask? How can you not read the comments, read their you know, reviews, anything to help them better? You just know better, you know better for them. I get, that's what she thinks, she knows best. Mother Rachel knows best, um, but it, you know, I, I don't, don't take this advice, <laughs> would be my advice. I don't know ever how things are doing until someone on the team tells me. And so Nicole and my team was like, oh my gosh, did you see the numbers on this episode? It like, it's like the best, the most successful podcast episode we've had in like four years. So I was like, well, hot damn, let's, let's think on that. So the episode was signs that your relationship might be in trouble. So I was in a place at the time where I was really thinking a lot about my marriage and that as much as I worked, really tried to save that relationship for seven years, five years, like all of these things, I realized in retrospect that there were signs that it was really needing to come to closure. And I put that off forever. And the biggest reason I put that off was because of my kids. And that's something a lot of people do. And it's totally understandable as to why. But I basically did a whole episode on the things that I realized now were really big red flags and that were breaking my personal boundaries and were really unhealthy. But back in the day, I couldn't see them as signs. I just kept thinking, you know, like I'm an Enneagram three, I'm an achiever. I just kept thinking like, I can fix this. Like if I work hard enough. No offense if you believe this. Oh, thank you, Ivatos. Welcome, welcome. I just want you to know. I want to be relatable. So. Now you know what you're in for. I appreciate your super chat. Um, what was I saying? Uh, she's talking about how there was red flags in the relationship. Okay, I forget the red flags, to be quite honest. The only thing I remember her talking about in that episode was that, no, that was the marathon episode when he went, I don't remember. Was there like nothing juicy? I don't even remember what her red flags were that she saw. And she kept it like vague because she didn't say like it was Dave necessarily all the time. And she was like, oh, there was a big secret that, you know, he wouldn't, he couldn't fix. I, I just, I don't even remember. Anyways, uh, let's go back a little bit and listen to the last part. Maybe it'll spark my memory. Hold on. Breaking my personal boundaries and were really unhealthy. Oh, the Enneagram. Okay. That's what I was going to say. Sorry if this is offensive, but... If you, if you say, well, I'm an Enneagram, whatever, and, or you say, well, I'm just like a Gemini, which I am a Gemini, uh, as like a reason as to why you are the way you are, red flag, beep boop, red flag to me. Uh, I think it's fun. It's a good time. And this is my personal opinion. So I'm sorry if I'm offending you, but this is how I truly feel. And I think it's important to know where I stand because it helps you realize where I'm coming from on certain things. So you can say you can decide if you align with me or not. And like I said, and I sh hope this is goes f clearly to, for the record, 
if you don't align with everything I say, that's okay. You don't have to. To follow and be a part and join and do whatever, you do not have to align with everything I say. You're still welcome. Um, but if you base your personality on a test that you don't even know who came up with the test or what the parameters were or what, it doesn't matter, or what the moon is at any given time, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. Go to therapy, figure out who you are, and then, you know, if you want to add on that you're a Gemini and that makes you feel a certain way, great. But if it's just, I know people in my own life that will not date someone who's like a Taurus or a Cancer. It's like, are you insane? These are fake things. And like people say like, well, I read the star, like, okay, the stars, are they really determining like this person that could be a good person in your life? The stars are, come on. I don't know. I think it's fun, but I think it's gotten overblown and people are using it to explain things in their life that don't need to be explained that way or are using it as like vehicles to, to take them away from healthy relationships and pushing them into an unhealthy one just because they were born in the month of December. Like, okay, that's my thing. That's my rant. Sorry. She's being a red flag right here by calling you saying like, oh, well, the Enneagram said, so I guess I should stay in my marriage. It's like, good Lord. But back in the day, I couldn't see them as signs. I just kept thinking, you know, like I'm an Enneagram three, I'm an achiever. I just kept thinking like, I can fix this. Like if I work hard enough, if I read enough books, if I go to enough conferences, if I work on myself enough, then I can be healthy enough and strong enough and figure this out for both of us and therefore our kids. And I now understand that that just absolutely wasn't true because you can't save someone else and you can't fix someone else. And it doesn't matter how much you work on yourself. You cannot heal someone for them, they have to heal for themselves. So I will give a point to Rachel here. I agree. You can't change people and you shouldn't really try to try to change them. You can only be yourself, decide what your boundaries are, and then make decisions based on that. So I will give her a point of solid advice here. You cannot change other people. Agreed. I did this episode and I guess it really struck a nerve. I guess maybe a lot of you are in that place. And maybe a lot of you are wondering like, hey, I've been with this guy for nine months, or I've been with this woman for two years, or, you know, maybe it's a new thing. Maybe it's like me and you've been together for 18 years. And you just, you don't want to be gossipy. You don't want to talk badly about that person behind that person's back, but you just want to like kind of understand if this is healthy or not. So if you want to go listen to that, it's episode 250 and you can dig in. So based on that idea that lots of people were kind of wanting to know what those questions were, wanting to know what those answers were, I thought that I would do this episode as kind of a follow-up and sort of what I think the next steps are if you have gone through a breakup, if you've gone through a divorce, or frankly, just straight up, if you know that your relationship is unhealthy if you know that you need to end it. But one of the ways that you're struggling is that you cannot imagine a life beyond the life you have. I think that one of the most powerful things that we can do is give ourselves a vision of something better, something different. But if you like me, my marriage, that was the first man I ever kissed. Like I had no other experience. So I couldn't even imagine what life would look like to be single. I couldn't imagine what it would look like to go through a breakup and if that's you, then I hope this episode is helpful for you and gives you just some things to think about. And the intention for this is how to become better after a breakup, not how to survive a breakup, not how to, you know, manage a breakup or deal with. No, this is how to become better, because if you are going to have. I mean, doesn't this just fit? Per I think when she decided to get divorced, she wrote this down in a journal or something. She wrote this exact you know, line of, of thinking, because this is exactly what she said about her marriage. She didn't want to have a good marriage. She didn't want to have a great marriage. She wanted to have an exceptional marriage and they were going to show up every day and choose joy and choose each other and go on dates and make out and raise the kids together and like whole, have a multi-million dollar business together because we're better than everyone else. And that was the message, right? Okay, then she decided, like, this sucks. I, I'm getting, you know, canceled, COVID, whatever. I'm sick of being in the house with this man for 18 years or whatever. Okay, I'm going to now decide. I'm going to be 
better after a breakup. I'm going to be the best broken up person with ever. I'm going to be exceptional at breaking up and being out of a relationship. I don't need Dave. I'm going to do this on my own. And she was sick of him anyways, because people were wanting, you know, him to sign her book. And, you know, there was complicated feelings around how he just got, she's talked about this in the past and I've talked about it in the past, but she was not jealous of him, but she was annoyed that he was getting so much attention by just walking in the door after she had built this business. And I can understand that, but the solution is not to necessarily break it off with him and then start your divorce business. I mean, whatever you could do whatever you want to do, but I don't think it was, she thought it was going to, everything she touched was going to be gold. And she didn't realize that, you know, she was kind of in the lane that she was in and that you can't just jump to the next lane. If, well, in her case, at least, um, Cause like Glennon Doyle, that's been a comparison been made a bunch of times that, you know, she was famous, I guess, or a writer at least before with a man, like married to a man, very Christian. I don't know much about her, but this is the basics that I know. And then she got divorced because she fell in love with a woman and then became even more famous after the breakup because it's a crazy story, right? Like that's just kind of unique to have a marriage, you know, be in the Christian space and then be a writer and then ha write your next book. And you're like, just kidding, I'm gay and I'm writing another book about it. Uh, I think that's what Rachel thought she could do. Like I was a marriage expert and then I became divorced and now I have even more better advice for women. And I, th I think she didn't read the room well enough because she w was so up here thinking that she was above everybody. This is my own thoughts. This is not like accurate. I don't know. I'm assuming she thought she could not do wrong. She was impenetrable and she didn't realize that she doesn't have the fan base if she was to leave Dave. And that's, I think, all of their mistake. Anyways, that was my second rant of the day. Back to the podcast. You walk through something as hard. I don't care how long you've been with someone. A breakup is difficult. Whether you chose the breakup or someone else broke up with you, it can be exhausting. It can be debilitating. There can be anger, sadness, fear, like so many negative emotions. And if you're going to have to walk through that hell, then you better come out the other side a better person because you can be better or you can be bitter, but you can't be both. That's a good line. I don't believe it. You can be better or you can be bitter, but you can't be both. I am both bitter and better from my relationships in the past. Who are you to tell me I can't be? Who are you to tell me I can't be bitter and better? But also, I am bitter, but also, I am also better. <laughs> Don't limit women, Rachel. I can be, I can be whatever I want. I thought that's what your journal told me. I could be whatever I set my mind to. I can be bitter and better. Beach. Okay, sorry, that was me. I didn't mean it. Okay, we're gonna skip over this commercial. But for many people, and you into what info best when you go best when you think this hurt. Oh. I'm the best friend. Me rise. Modernfertility.com slash R I S E. It's weird that she's doing modern fertility. I'll just say that. It's weird. I don't even listen to the ads, but it, I don't I don't get that branding. It's a little odd. Here are some things that I think really helped me to become a better version of myself. I think today, as I'm recording this for you at the end of February, I think I'm the best version of myself I have ever been. I am the best mama. I'm the best friend. I'm the best partner. This is the most kindness I've ever shown myself. This is the most love I've ever given myself. I have found in this process a, a grace for realizing that I am human and that I make mistakes and that I'm not perfect. But even when we're not perfect, we can still be really good, valuable beings. And I think you question a lot of that when you are inside of a hard relationship, or maybe you're in a relationship with someone who's judging you or nitpicking you or telling you why you aren't great or telling you why you suck on the, you know, the lowest end of the spectrum, on the highest end of the spectrum, there are people who are emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, physically abusive. And if you're in that cycle long enough, you start to believe that that's true. You start to believe the words of the villain instead of the words of the hero that's inside of you. So some things that really help. The one thing I was really hoping that Rachel got out of her cancellation or, you know, people turning their back on her or not, you know, worshiping her, I think. I think that's what it 
canceling meant for her. She wasn't canceled. She's still on every single platform. She has every opportunity that she, you know, nothing's been taken away from her except for, you know, people don't want to work with her maybe or people aren't buying her tickets. That's not cancellation. It's not like she was kicked off of the internet. Um, But (laughs) the one thing I think that Rachel, you know, didn't need to learn afterwards is that she's the best at everything. (laughs) That's the opposite of what I think people wanted her to learn. She's like, ow, I got divorced and I'm better. I'm a better mom. I'm a better friend. I'm a better person to myself. I'm a better person for humanity. It's like, great, wonderful, love that for you. But that wasn't the point. The point was to realize that you're human and that you've made a mistake and to rectify that mistake as best you can. Uh, And maybe not lie to people in the future about how great your relationships are when they're really not. But that doesn't seem to be coming through whatsoever. And that I think are why I am doing better today after going through a divorce two years ago. The one thing I'll say before I continue on is if you dig this episode and you have a friend who's trying to decide if they should break up, who's trying to decide what to do next, or who's really struggling in the aftermath of a breakup, please send them this episode. Forward them the YouTube video, send them the podcast. I think that one of the greatest ways that we can be leaders is whenever we find something that helps us, we send it to someone else. Like I'm reading a book right now that I absolutely love. And I do this every time I read or learn. If I find something that I love, I immediately am like, okay, who needs this? I'm constantly sending out in the world. So if this podcast is helpful to you, please send it along. Now, the first thing. Yeah, definitely has nothing to do with my engagement numbers for sure. Definitely nothing to do with it. It's just something that every entrepreneur should do. Every entrepreneur should definitely not read their analytics. They should post their content and just hope that it does well and never do any sort of, you know, uh, secondary follow-up, you know, looking at it to see how it was uh, how it was taken. And then also um, just send out random thoughts to all of your friends at all times about what they should be reading. Good advice. Thanks, Rach. That I did that I think is so freaking key is I allowed myself the time to grieve. I allowed myself the time to heal. I know. No, you didn't. Time, like how much faster could you have gotten into a relationship? That wouldn't have been ridiculous. And you have kids, like with the kids thing too, it's like you didn't give them much time to grieve their dad being out of the house or you being out of the house and having two places to go and Christmas and all that. There was not much time before other relationships were involved. She says she met her boyfriend says a year ago. So February of 2021. She announced the divorce in June of 2020. So June of 2020 into June of 2021, one year, she was already with this guy. So how, like, you need to be realistic. You know, she's got money and and ability to go to Hawaii and think for a week and all that. Most people don't have that luxury. So to give advice of like, I waited so long to grieve, less than a year, come on, girl, get serious. Girl, get a calendar because you did not grieve for that long, in my opinion. There's no timeline for grief or whatever. But I mean, come on, we're all like reasonable people here, right? Like if she had waited five years, I'd be like, okay, that's a good amount of time. I can't argue that she waited and she like figured herself out. Less than a year. I think I have some rights to say that seemed that at least seems short. Am I right or am I right? Am I bitter or am I better? Come on. Eh? Very many people who go through a breakup and have someone immediately. Like they find a person to date as soon as they possibly can. And this never, this never goes well. This does not go well. I mean, I couldn't even fathom dating someone else when I went through my break. I, I didn't even have that vision. And like, I remember that being such an issue when we were going through the process of breaking up is that, and maybe this is a male thing, but my ex was so focused on like, you're going to go out, you're going to find someone else. This is because you want someone else. And I was like, I didn't actually say this. This is just in my head. I was like, bitch, (laughs) I am not trying to find somebody else. I'm trying to find myself. Like I had, it was, it was so heavy and hard and like, carrying 
you know, holding this thing together for so many years, I did not want another man at all. I didn't want I don't believe her. I'm going to say that right now. But uh, going back to what Dave allegedly said, and she just puts his business out there. Like, like I said, like I'm no Dave fan or supporter. But does this need to be publicly stated that he was upset? Like we already know he did not want to get divorced. And I think he made the, well, I don't know if he made the right choice, but he made a choice to tell people up front that it was Rachel's decision. And I think that just enraged her probably uh, with good reason, because now her plans kind of off. Cause at first they were like, we're getting divorced, but we're choosing joy and we're going to be best friends, but we're just different people, blah, blah, blah. But then he kind of started talking on his own because now he's able to, cause he's single man. He's like, well, Rachel really wanted to do it and I wanted to fight for it and she didn't want to. So that doesn't make her look super great, especially as someone who says that she has to work hard for a marriage and you can't just have an exceptional marriage doing nothing. You have to put on your boots and strap them up, baby, and take them out to dinner or whatever. That was her whole message for years. And now she's like saying like, oh, he just didn't want me to get with somebody. He was nervous. It's like, that's a pretty normal reaction, I think. It's like, why are you trying to break up? What, what's the point? Why are you doing this? You just try to be with someone else. Like that's kind of like a vulnerable moment. And I feel sort of bad for him in, in a sense that like now his business is out there for people to judge like myself. Um, and he got with someone real quick. So, I mean, he, he got with someone first, which is kind of probably explains maybe the reason why he jumped into a relationship so quick because he was nervous that Rachel was going to get into a relationship very quickly uh, or immediately and then, you know, he, so he got involved with someone, Heidi, really fast. Like, I think it was like three months, six months max that they were already like officially dating from the divorce announcement. And so she was like, what, nine months or something? I don't know. They're all crazy. <laughs> that's what I just, I, that's the whole point. It's like, these people should not, these people, they could live their life however they want, but giving advice to others about how to, they should model their relationships, it's so ridiculous because they are barely scratching the surface of acceptable or reasonable. You could argue like, well, you know, maybe it's okay for them. It's like, yeah, it might be okay for them, but for the majority of people to prop yourself up on a pedestal and say, this is a good advice. No, 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 not good. Okay, moving on. Partner. I didn't want a woman. I didn't want any, but I, I just wanted to be alone. I just was like, well, what would it feel like energetically if the only people that I was responsible for were myself and my kids? And I did not want so. And I couldn't even, I literally could not imagine. And I am a diehard romantic, but it, I couldn't even see that world for myself. And I really thought like, I'm going to be alone forever and it's going to be great. And I'm going to like, you know, mm -hmm. buy some cool house like in practical magic and like eventually my friends and I are all get old enough we'll just live in this house and like be the town witches or whatever like I had no desire <laughs> to find someone again and the uh, the line that I love okay second thing uh if that's true why would you get on a dating app and I didn't know this until I looked it up the other day but the alleged dating app that they met on which is uh like a celebrity dating app has a waiting list which could be months long depending on how big of a celebrity you are which i would say she's on the lower end of celebrity in my opinion uh in the grand scheme of the world no one in my real life knows who she is um you only really know her if you were in an mlm or you watch our content like you know the anti self-help community or you're into self-help but other mainstream people they don't know her no offense rach rach um so she had gone on this dating app, probably had somewhat of a wait period. So if you're really not ready and this is like, you would love being single, why would you do it and get on it and meet somebody and immediately date them, the first person you met on there? If that, it's just, it's just bullshit. It's just like, you're lying to yourself if that's what you really think. Your actions don't match what you're saying here. I heard this when I was like, just at the start of my divorce, I heard someone say, it takes a really good man to be better than no man at all. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, you better be really good because being single is freaking awesome. Awesome. And I know that I am speaking as someone who has had marriage, who has had kids. And so it's easy for me to say at 39 years old, post-divorce with four kids, that I love being single, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And we always want what we 
don't have. But I'm just telling you, like, there is a world. I was, where was I? I was at the dentist recently. And there was a young gal who was in training who's helping the dentist. At who she calls everyone gal now. I guess girls out. Now she's calling women gals. Okay. Um, I just want to say again, this is a quick, quick aside. She's only been single in her whole life. So she got with, she met Dave when she was 18. She got married when she was like 19. She's been single a total of like one year, maybe like to put together. And we don't even know the exact. So February, again, February, 2021, they got, so they had like nine months collectively single. How can you, that it's so good your whole life. You're 39 years old. It's so amazing to be single that you've only done it for less than a year collectively. It don't add up girlfriend. It did not add up. Your mom. And the young gal, the dentist said to the young gal, like, oh, are you, did you do anything fun this week? And she's like, oh my gosh, I just really needed it. I just slept all day, just slept all day. Sunday, just woke up and said, no, just slept. And at some point I went and rolled out to the couch. I watched Netflix for a couple hours and then I kept on sleeping. And the dentist and I looked at each other. We were like, oh my word, like girl, live that life, live it to the fullest. Yes. If you are single and you're dreaming of being in a re relationship or, you know, having kids or doing those things, like my gosh, yes, I get it. But also while you're in this space, enjoy it. And for me, when I, when I went through my breakup that I knew, I just knew that even if this felt like a relief to me, it was still brutal. It was so brutal to go through divorce. It, I, I don't even have words for how horrible it was and how, ugh, I don't even want to, don't even want to deal. But I just knew that that was taking such an insane. If we remember too, and I kind of want to bring it up for a second, just for a quick sec, because this is all also new information. I mean, she's in the last probably six months, she's said like how bad the divorce was, but originally she did not. She made it seem like we're great we're amazing. Dave and I are besties. We're choo she literally says we chose joy or we're choosing joy or some bullshit. I just want to look at the post where they announced the divorce because I remember reading it. And I was like, bullshit. And here we are a year later, two years later. I think this is it. Okay, guys, I have some really hard news to share. And the honest truth is I have no idea how someone announces something like this. So I'm just going to say it. Dave and I have made the incredibly difficult decision to end our marriage. And I don't understand why she chose this photo. <laughs> we're, we're choosing to end our marriage. <laughs> God, so cringy. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't even want to raise the whole thing. Maybe I should. Okay. We started out as best friends 18 years ago. And the truth is that core... That, that core friendship and the parts of us that work so well have become a band-aid for the parts of us that don't. We have worked endlessly over the last three years. So now it's three years. It's been seven years. It's been five years. Now this is three years. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh my God. Thank you, Rosie. Dang, girl. Dang, gal. Uh, Rachel wanted to be a single mother, Rach, who's now dating. I'm relatable, but I'm not, but I am. <laughs> But also, I want to be a single mother and also relatable. But also, I'm not bitter. I'm bitter. Did you, you forgot one part though, Rosie. Am I the only hippie? She's also a hippie. So thank you very much for that uh, super chat. That was awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we're, we have worked endlessly over the last three years to make this work and have come to the conclusion that it is healthier and more respectful for us to choose this as the end of our journey as a married couple. We remain dear friends as we raise our family as co-parents and run our company as partners. We are choosing joy, even though, I'll be honest, the last month has been one of the most awful of our lives. I want to be strong and bold and optimistic for you now, but every ounce of my energy is reserved for going on to dating apps and finding the next man that I can use to my content. I'm just kidding. That part, that last part was added by me. Not what she says. <laughs> what matters most for our four kids and the next chapter of what our family looks like. <laughs> And then someone's comment, is Dave in a rehab center? Fans are worried. He literally just disappeared. Prayers. <laughs> oh, boy. I love Instagram. No, I don't. I love TikTok. That's my app of choice. TikTok and... Well, I'm on... Oh, I shouldn't lie. I'm on Instagram all day long.
Anyways, back to the uh, podcast. <laughs> so, yeah. Now she's saying it was, it's so hard. It's like literally eh, 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 so hard. But back then she was like, we're choosing joy. We're, we're choosing this. We're, so what happens? No more? You can't choose anymore? You can't choose joy anymore? I guess you have to choose sadness. Hey, choose sadness. Now available in the link below. Okay. Sorry. Let's go back. Let's start playing this again. Bye. Emotional toll on me and I needed the time to heal. So had a lot of therapy during that time period um, and tried all sorts of therapy. I tried energy healing. I, you know, went to see mediums. I went to see psychics. I was just like, if anyone wants to talk to me. Hold up, hold up. This is an important part. You know how she's talked about, she's, I, I've always, I hope so. I hope I've always given her a big, big, big props for saying therapy is good. Therapy is great. Go to therapy. Traditional therapy, if you can. Not these life coach bullshit like seminar weekend, I'm going to heal you in one second therapies, like actual cognitive behavioral therapy is what I think is the number one thing for people that helps them change for the better. It helped me. I can only speak for what's helped me. I've done everything else, spiritual bullshit, garbage, whatever, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what it's called, right? Basically talk therapy. You go and talk to someone often for a long period of time. It helps. So I've always given her credit because she's always said in my, at least from what I've known, that she has done therapy. But now she's saying therapy like mediums. No, 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 girl. No, 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 gal. No, that's not the same thing. But I want to hear her twice. Let me just hear it. Me And I needed the time to heal. So had a lot of therapy during that time period um, and tried all sorts of therapy. I tried energy healing. It's not all sorts of therapy, in my opinion. Therapy is therapy, and then the rest is like self-care or fun thing that you do for fun or like going to a, get a massage or something. I don't consider it therapy. You could say it's massage therapy, but I think it's very important that you point out exactly like what you're talking about. And when she said like, I went to a medium, I'm like, that's not therapy, girl. That's a scam. That'd be a scam. Okay, so I'm, I, her wording is a little, I mean, I could be taken either way, so I feel a little bit better about it, but I think it, it, this should not be considered therapy. You know, went to see mediums, I went to see psychics. I was just like, if anyone wants to talk to me about what I'm going through, I'm here for it. And just sort of, I don't really take anything as the capital T truth for, for it all, but I think that we can glean little nuggets or little bits of wisdom from all sorts of different teachers. And so when I'm, when I'm going through something hard, I kind of just you know, look for, okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to go see this therapist. I'm going to go to this group. I'm going to, you know, go get a massage. I'm going to, I'll just try a little bit of everything because it all ends up helping me and it all ends up allowing me to go inside and really process what I'm thinking. And I will say that I think that was a huge part of my healing process too, was I didn't numb myself out. And I'm watching the ramifications of friends who've gone through. Excuse me, what? You've talked many, many times about how much you drink. Is that not numbing yourself out? Hard breakups and rushed into a new relationship and or numbed themselves out. So they never really processed what happened. And Is she projecting? Is she just like trying to like deflect? It's like that person who farts <laughs> and goes, that wasn't me. I never farted in my life. I have never farted once. I always make sure that if I feel like I'm going to fart, I, I, I leave the country. <laughs> Just to deflect away. She's, the two things that she's saying that she's never done are the two th main things that I see that she's done. At least from what she's shared from all the different platforms that I've seen her on. She's talked about how much she drank when she got canceled. Just the other day. Keep your story straight, gal. I can't stop now. I have to sound by gal. Like, what? Years later, all of this stuff is bubbling up in them because they didn't deal with it. And, then and I'm not saying it's easy. It is freaking brutal to have to confront all of it and look at yourself and understand why things went wrong. Because if you're really on a healing journey, then that means you also take ownership of the part that you played in that breakup. Like, even if it ended badly and they were the ones that ended it, you didn't want it to end or even if you ended it, but it was years after you should have, and you have to look at the truth that you allowed someone to treat you badly, or you allowed someone to make you feel small, or you allowed someone to anchor you to the earth, whatever your version of this is, there's always two people inside of a relationship. And you have to take ownership of the part that you played, not 
the part that they played or what they did, but at least how did you add to this? And maybe the way you added this is you should have never been in a relationship with this person in the first place. But even in that, you have to acknowledge it and take ownership because if you don't, that like emotional cycle is just going to follow you. That's just going to show up in your next relationship again and again and again. You're going to keep playing out the same things. The universe gives us opportunity again and again to get it right. And every time we do the same stupid crap, the universe is like, all right, we'll try this again in six months. Thank you for playing. <laughs> so taking the time to heal. Taking the time to heal, but gives no exact time frame because, of course, she can't. Because what's she going to say? Six months work for me. I think she knows that's pretty bad advice. So she's just like generally saying, like, take the time you need to heal. Don't numb yourself. Don't go back and listen to my episodes that I've talked about numbing myself either. Just just take my advice here and don't listen to anything I've said in the past about what I've done. And yeah, I think she's also trying to throw David under the bus. Like, oh, he drinks so much and he's been kind of open about his drinking, which again, I, I feel like this is like a sympathy for Dave episode, but like, you know, he's been sort of open about it. And if that's all that is going on with him, that he struggled with drinking in the past and he wrote up his book, he was very honest about it. Uh, he's look, seems like he's gone to some sort of program for it. Uh, she should back off of saying that, oh, he's got a secret double life. Because if that's all it is, it's not that secretive. He wrote a effing book about it. So I wish he would just be open about what the thing was that caused them so many issues. Because if it's drinking, I think she needs to lay off because we already know about that. And she has a weird relationship with alcohol too. Like she's always like, oh, I don't, I, I'm an alcoholic. She said that to Oprah, that she was an alcoholic. Okay, but then she talks about drinking all the time, how she loves tequila. She loves going to the bars to drink. She's buying shots to bring joy to people. She's drinking wine at happy hour on the patio. Like, I'm confused. Are you an alcoholic that just is better than everyone else? That you don't, you can just control yourself now? That you don't numb yourself and let, but then she says she does numb herself, like when she got canceled and wasn't reading the comments. She was just sitting in her house, not eating, but drinking. All of this is like confusing. And the fact that she can sit there with a straight face, watch, I'm assuming unless she's laughing hysterically in the microphone and say this stuff, it's just not even true based on her own account. <laughs> it's delusions. That is huge. The second thing that I did, and this is like clutch, you guys, this is, this is it, is I definitely, I remember the year of my breakup that basically until the fall. So like I could see the end uh, in early spring and I was honest about seeing that end in spring and basically summer into fall was just abysmal. It was hard. It was brutal. It was rough. It was all the things. It was crying. It was screaming. It was all the stuff. But in the fall, and in the like the winter and really like at the start of the new year. So it was a new year. It was my birthday. I really was like, okay, it's time. And what it was time for, for me was I just wanted to have fun. I felt like I had been, and maybe some of you are in this, just in this like winter, right? Like I had been in this emotional winter. I'd been in this really hard season and I just wanted some joy. And I knew that joy wasn't going to come and like knock on my door and you'd be like, Hey girl, let's go. I knew that I was going to have to create opportunities and experiences where I could be joyful. So, I mean, I got my best friends involved. But then again, I just read the whole caption. She said before she was choosing joy to remain best friends with Dave. It was just the marriage that had come to an end. Their relationship, the core of their relationship was still intact. So was that bullshit or has things changed? Have things changed? I guess we'll never know, you know? And I have no problem with her wanting to have fun. I think that's natural. Like you grieve the relationship for a little bit, you go and have fun, and then you, you figure out what's next. She, you know, I think it from spring until winter, whatever, like that's a time frame thing for you. But I don't know. I mean, this is like advice too, like more if you're younger. Like I see people saying like, this is a divorce with children. This is more advice for someone who's broken up with in high school. 
You know, like you have a boyfriend, the girlfriend, whatever, they break up with you, you're sad about it. A couple months later, you're like, all right, I feel better. Okay, a couple months later, you go, okay, I'm gonna go to the homecoming and then I'm gonna, you know, get a new boyfriend or decide to go with my friends to prom or whatever. That's great advice for that type of time period. This kids are involved, custody, you know, sharing of homes, buying new properties. Like this, this is much more complicated than she's making it seem. And you're also someone who gives advice to women. So wouldn't you want to do a little extra work to make sure that any advice that you give in the future is good advice? No, the answer is no. And we just, the shenanigans that we got up to, the things that we did, we just tried all sorts of new things and we'd try new restaurants, we'd try new coffee places and we'd go, you know, have adventures, we'd go on hikes. Like I did a ton of stuff by myself. If you've ever read Julia Cameron's The Artist Way, which I just am gonna keep recommending to you guys, you know, she talks about this idea of going on artist dates and I did that all the time. I, would, I went to museums and I went to, you know, funky little shops that I saw on Instagram and I just pushed myself to like leave the house and go do things with the expectation that I was going to have fun. And there was such beauty in that because when you've been in a relationship for a long time, often the only fun we know about is like fun that we had as a couple. We really don't know if you've been in a relationship for a while, what it feels like to be single and going and having fun. And yeah, we just had like the best time with the intention of just doing things that were different. And part of it too, I think was we had been inside of COVID for a year and we all just wanted to like do something just to leave the house and to do something. And I will say this, even if you're not going through a breakup, but you're feeling really stuck, you're feeling like life is monotonous. You just kind of like blah, go freaking do something you don't normally do. If you get coffee, let's say, if you get coffee once or twice a week, or maybe even once a week, if you love coffee and you're getting, and you go to the same place every week to get coffee. Dave Ramsey told me that's not good for me. I don't get coffee. I drink dirt water from the floor to save money because Dave Ramsey told me I'm not allowed to get coffee anymore just kidding <laughs> like if you haven't tried other places in your town if you haven't driven across town if you haven't just what like go do something different and maybe you go and the coffee sucks right but you're gonna have an experience you're gonna see people you're gonna maybe drive by a different part of town I'm just always open to the idea that like you know I'm being guided and I'm gonna see something cool or experience something or have a moment of my guardian angels, my spirit guides. Gratitude I wouldn't have had if I just like hung out at home. So I had fun. She only believes she's being guided when it's positive. If it's a negative, like, oh, she's, you know, canceled or people are upset with her or, you know, something, whatever happens. No, that's not a sign. That's not any indication of anything except for people being mean to her. But if uh, she's going to a coffee shop and she comes across a TJ Maxx, well, that was her spirit guides telling her that she deserves everything in the world. She deserves to be happier than everyone else. It's like they just pick and choose what they're guided by, depending on what the story is. That was a big deal. And again, I do think enlisting the help of my friends to have fun was just a big, huge part of that. It was the stuff that we do. And I think it ended up being fun for everybody. The third thing that I did, and this feels like a really big one after going through a breakup, is I relearned myself. I had to meet the woman that I am now. That was really important to take the time to relearn who I am, who I am now, and ask myself also who I want to be. And I, I think that's so essential because eventually I did date. Okay, so this part she's going to talk about, we can go back a second. She talks about, you know, being with who you want to be. I think this is horrible advice, and I'll, I'll tell you what. My therapist says, and <laughs> my real therapist, an actual licensed professional who's, you know, worked for decades, um, she says, and this is something that I had to unlearn too, that Rachel is now going to try to teach people to, to indoctrinate themselves. So this is why I had to unlearn what she's about to say. If you're so focused on the next step, like, okay, when, when I'm a famous YouTuber, when I'm a famous, I wanted to be a news anchor when I was younger. When I'm a famous news anchor working for NBC, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be with someone who's like also very professional and very serious about their work. 
so that's what I used to think. Like I need to find someone who's going to be or or currently is already obsessed with work and works 20,000 hours a day. But right now I was like just, you know, entry level job working my way up. So I was meeting people who I did not match with. I did not connect with. And I was forcing myself to think like, okay, well, I need to make this work because this person is serious. This is the type of person I want to be, but it wasn't me. I'm much more laid back. I was like, you know, going to sports bars and stuff. I had nothing to do with working professionally and being in New York and being a famous person. Like that wasn't my life. So me and these people that I was going to be like, didn't work for me. It made me feel like I didn't fit in or I didn't connect with people. So this advice sucks. I think that she's about to give, I just want to give my preemptive story about didn't work for me. Tried it. Bad advice in my opinion. And I did find love again. Okay. We're going back who I am, who I am now and ask myself also who I want to be. And I, I think that's so essential because eventually I did date and I did find love again. And I think that if I hadn't gone through this process of relearning me today, I might have accidentally or unintentionally basically just been the woman I was in my marriage with this new relationship. I would have created the same cycle. And I'm so grateful that I took the time because it's, it's really crazy. I, I really want to stress this because this is not something I anticipated especially if you got with your partner when you were young. So I met my ex-husband when I, I was 18. When I sent him the first email, we went on our first date when I was 19. I was very young. I was totally inexperienced in every way. And so I grew up really inside of that marriage, but also I really kind of learned my likes and dislikes inside of our relationship. And I was raised to be a people pleaser. And I was raised that the man was always right. And I was raised that he was supposed to be the head of our family. And that had all sorts of horrible effects, I think, for both of us. But the gist of it is you forget. I I don't know, maybe not if you're older, more mature, and you are more sure of yourself. Great. But there's so many pieces of me that I lost along the way. And the story I always remember was so pivotal. And this is, seems so stupid, but it was a huge deal. I was at my new house and I was by myself. The kids were with their dad. And it was like one of the first weekends that I was like totally alone at home in this new place. And I was in bed with my laptop and. Okay, everybody, <laughs> this is a moment that I need to bring up. Remember the podcast from like, a year ago now, I did a video about it where she was like, I'm perfect at being single. I'm so good at being single. And she's like, I slept on the floor. I slept because I couldn't be with Dave one more second. I slept on the floor because I'm poor and I don't have money. And she like, she didn't say that, but that was the, that was kind of like the relatability. Like I just needed to leave my horrible relationship and I did anything I could. And I slept on the ground for so, I was so grateful when a couch came through because of COVID, blah, blah, blah. She's like, this is one of the first weeks I was alone in my bed. <gasps> she lied. I'm shocked utterly shocked and dismayed that there was lies being told to me that I believed. I didn't believe it for a second, but cause it's like, also like you have beds at Dave's house, just take a U-Haul or hire somebody. Cause you have a whole freaking company. Allegedly go take a bed over to, from Dave's guest room to your house, whatever. So she had a bed the whole time. Cool. Just wanted to point that out, that that was a lie that she had told. I, it was so funny. I was like, we had Netflix at like, when I was married, we had Netflix, obviously. And I had gotten Netflix for myself. I got my own account. And then I was like, <laughs> so stupid, you guys. I was like, I, I want other streaming services. Like I'm going to get other streaming services, like a big deal. Like, oh, I could get HBO Max, even though we didn't have that. Like, I, I want to see the shows that are on HBO. So like, I could try out this. It sounds so stupid, but you get really set and you just sort of think, oh, this is how life is. This is who we are as people. And you don't really question. So I signed up for those two streaming services and I was like watching, I was going to like figure out how to watch Netflix, which sounds stupid, except that for a decade, I didn't watch, I didn't stream anything. I didn't watch TV. I didn't do anything. And 
it really allowed me to focus in and be productive and write books and be successful. But I also have some like understanding now of why I felt like I couldn't do something like stream a show. Like, oh, I have to keep everything together. So if I'm slacking off, like watching TV, this is all going to fall apart. But I didn't understand. Your husband worked at Disney. What the are you talking about? Your husband was an executive at the Walt Disney Company. You were not holding it all together. He was holding you together, if anything. God, I feel like I'm like Dave's like Heidi. I'm basically Heidi in this situation, like defending him. I am all about getting a free ride. He's getting free defense attorney bills from me. No, that wasn't right. He's getting free defense from me. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, but he was holding it all together. Maybe not well. I don't know. He probably is a jerk. I, I'm not saying he's not a jerk, but like financially, I mean, she was, she was working, but there was, I don't think her company really took off till, you know, 2018 when he then jumped ship from Disney and came over to work for the company. So it, it, this the whole narrative too about she was holding the whole family together. If, if he was to be unemployed, okay, I can understand. Like, look, you know, she's hustling and running this company and all that stuff. You are a blogger. Come on. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, don't act like that was the, the financial windfall that, you know, allowed you to go on vacation to Hawaii, allowed you to go and, you know, travel and hire people and all that. That was Dave. Don't project that onto yourself. That's unfair to him and the contributions he did make to her. Anyways the time so here i am in my new house i've got netflix and i'm just trying to figure out like what i want to watch like you do when you you know if you've ever had a new streaming service you sort of kind of scroll through and see what your vibe is and one of the shows that first couple weeks that netflix kept recommending to me was a show called the witcher okay if you've seen it it's henry cavill he it's like based on um a video game and it's super high fantasy, set in a different world, world building, creatures, monsters, whatever. And so finally, they keep recommending it to me. And I finally go in and watch the trailer. And I watch the trailer. I'm like, that actually looks great. And I immediately X out and keep scrolling. And it took like 90 seconds for it to click in my brain that I had actually just thought that looks great. And then I was like, wait, why am I not watching the show? And I realized it's because my ex-husband hates fantasy. Lord of the Rings, anything where like creatures have names that are not anything that's not real life, he hates. And that's okay. He's a human. He's allowed to have likes and dislikes and whatever. Okay. Once again, I'm going to defend and have Dave's back here. I'm the same way. I much prefer nonfiction. I, I you know, my fiance, Stephen is his name. I call him my fiance because I haven't like said his name yet. I don't know why. Um, but his name is Steven. So from now, this point forward, he will be referred to as Steven with a PH. Uh, Steven loves games. He loves fantasy. He loves like Zelda and Mario. I think he likes too. But Zelda's like the big one. But he likes, you know, car anime, cartoons, all of it. And I struggle because I'm like more of like a documentary, true crime, you know, at the time before. Rachel Hollis content, Gary Vee content, like anything that's like going to help me, you know, whatever. And I come from a journalism background. It's like what I like. I like that stuff. I can't help it. And we do butt heads sometimes about it. But, you know, in therapy, I talked about that for a while. And it was like, well, why don't you just compromise? And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> duh. OK, so we have, you know, certain times. It's like, OK, we watch certain things together. We watch certain things apart and we watch we compromise on certain days. That's really solved the issue. You know, it could have been blown out of proportion and been like, oh, my God, like he's not the one for me. He likes fantasy and I don't. Oh, my God. Like this is a sign from the ether, from my spirit guides. They're telling me something. It's like, no, just compromise. Just literally work on it. That's, I think, what a relationship should be doing. But anyways, um, the whole thing too is funny that he worked for Disney and he doesn't like anything. He's all she's like outing him again. Like, oh, my God, he worked at Disney and hates hates stories about family and friendship <laughs> he hates family friendly friendship stories he hates it he also hates really well done 3d animations he hates that <laughs> it's like stop insulting him he worked for a company that produces that like relax rachel anyways <laughs> so funny and interesting 
And it's also like, do you have Disney Plus? I would hope you would get a free subscription. When did that come out? 2021? Maybe they were already divorced by then. All right, cool. Relatable story, Rach, thanks. Let's continue. Yeah. But on the flip side, I love fantasy. Love it. Like, I, I'm here for it all. I'm here for Star Wars. I'm here for L Lord of the Rings. Saw every single one of them the night they came out in the movie theater. Like, I love Dune. I think it's the greatest movie. Oh, my Lord. I thought Dune was so spectacular. Like, I am, I'm here for all of this. So I see the show and I realize, oh, my gosh, I actually love this kind of show. But I haven't watched this kind of show in forever because we tend to do this thing where we're like, oh, if my partner doesn't like it, I'm not even going to get into it because we can only do things we do together, right? Hello, codependency. So it was this huge moment of being like, oh my gosh, I forgot this part of myself. I forgot that I love this stuff. I forgot that I love to read these books. I forgot that I was into this thing, which sounds really simple. And maybe you're like, well, who freaking cares? I do because it's a part of me that I had shut off because I knew that he didn't like it. I mean, moving out on my own, this sounds again so silly, but there were- This all sounds like a personal issue, not a marital issue, a personal one. You can't separate from your husband with interests, with going out, with do This all could be solved within a marriage, inside of a marriage, if you wanted to. This is not to me deal-breaking information. She, I think she, that this is what really caused her to, to divorce him. But people don't like that because it's kind of like a, she just gave up because she was annoyed by him, which fine, it's your right to do whatever you want to do. But then kind of now putting this thing like, oh, this deep, dark secret is what caused us. And I'm like, I'm having doubts that anything actually happened. At first I was like, yeah, okay, I'm on board. I think something could have happened. Now that she's like talked more and more about it, I'm like, I don't think anything really did happen. I could be persuaded the other way again, but I, now I'm starting to think like, it's just these little things. Like he didn't like watching The Witcher. So now she's like, she got to a point where she's like, I'm fed up with this. I'm over it. Divorce. I'll be fine. I can start my divorce saga or my divorce period of the, my business. Uh -huh. I don't know. These spices and herbs and different things that I use in my cooking that I never did because he liked things simple. And so you just learn to accommodate your partner. It, it didn't even occur to me back then to be like, oh, well, I'll just make it this way. And then like, I'll put the, these things on my food. I just like didn't even bring them into the house. When I moved in here, I got wind chimes. I love wind chimes. My grandma had wind chimes. My favorite aunt had wind chimes. They're so soothing. I think they're so beautiful. He hated wind chimes. And there was a way of like, oh, if, if it just was easier. And man, that's like shitty feminist of me to not stand up for things that were for me, but it was just easier to be like, oh, okay, I don't want to listen to how much you dislike this. So I'm just going to cut it out because it's not that big a deal, right? It's wind chimes. It's using dill in the tuna salad. It's, you know, watching a fantasy movie instead of whatever, but it's a thousand little things. Those, are, those, those thousand little nuances that make you who you are, that make you an individual person instead of someone that matches them. And again, I am not blaming my ex for this. These are decisions that I made because I didn't have the self-confidence because I very young learned a certain way of behavior. And then of course I would grow into a woman doing that. But the reason that I tell you is if I hadn't taken the time to relearn myself and to ask, who am I today? Then there's no way I would be living the life that I'm living. And there's no way that I would be inside of the relationship that I have. And for anybody who wants to be in love again, who wants to have a healthy, thriving relationship, you have got to figure out who you are now, and who you aspire to be. Because you are trying to find a mate that is a match for who you aspire to be, not who. Okay, this is the part that I was bringing up before. Like, you have to find a mate, which I think is a very interesting term, a mate. God, sounds like biology. Uh, find a mate that you want to be with for who you aspire to be. It's like, that's why these, no, okay, not to go off on a tangent, but that's why some men, not all men, some that I've, you know, been around, they feel entitled to the hottest woman or the most in shape person or the woman with like the best personality and the best accolades. Meanwhile, they have not even begun to start a career or, or own a property or have anything going for them necessarily or have a good personality that's caring and kind, you know, they live at home or whatever, which is fine. But it's like, 
They demand the highest level of, of partner, of mate, because they aspire to be a stockbroker. It's like, you, how can, like, maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. I'm supposed to just believe it and go, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll marry you with, with who you aspire to be? It's just, just stupid advice. Because I aspired at one time to be a news anchor. It didn't work out. I decided I didn't like it anymore. I didn't like the industry. I wanted to be, you know, someone who reviewed wellness services. I've come a long ass way from that point, you know, just like five years ago. And it's like, you don't know what's going to happen. You could change. People change all the time. You can't force them to change, but people do change on their own, evolve, whatever dating someone or marrying someone you aspire to be, I just think is stupid. Get with someone who at the core you f love spending time with, you value, and you're going to stick with through thick and thin. That's what you say in your vows, right? I'm not married yet, but I wouldn't get married until I for sure could live by the vows that I've said. And if it changes, of course, you can get divorced. I'm not against divorce or anything, but it's like, that's why I think marriage is like important that you pick someone that you really do believe that if it, things got bad, you would want to at least try to work on it. I mean, that's my personal take. I'm not religious at all. I don't really, really know if I believe in this, the industry or the, what do you call it? The uh, institution of marriage necessarily as an engaged woman. Um, you know, Stephen and I have talked about that a lot. And as much as we talk about it and are figuring it out, it's, I still would only want to be with him if I felt like if my life completely fell apart, his life completely fell apart, I would still be there and vice versa. That's my own opinion about marriage, but why do it then? <laughs> Monetary gain? Like, what's the point? Anyways, okay, back to Rachel giving bad advice. You are not even who you are. You want to find someone who will match up and be in sync with the person you're becoming. It's like, if you think of it in terms of business, there's this thing that I didn't understand when I started to grow my business and later sort of handed it to an executive team so that I could write the books and do the podcast and do all these things. And I don't really think the team understood this either is when you're growing your business, I'm just going to make up fake numbers. So let's say you have a business that makes $100,000 a year and you're on track to do half a million. That's a huge increase. And you know that you need a, you know, a senior accountant or maybe even a CFO to guide you from going to 100,000 to 500,000. I'm making up these numbers, guys. Most people think, oh, I need to find a CFO who has managed $500,000 because that's where we're going. When the reality is you need to find a CFO who's managed $1.5 million. You want to work with someone that has done beyond where you are so they know how to guide you through every part of the process. And I think it's the same with relationships. You want to be with someone who, yes, there's a, there's a magnetism, there's a chemistry, there's a love and an admiration for who you are, but that they're also going to be a perfect match for who you're going to be. Because that is fundamentally, like without question, one of the biggest nails in the coffin of my previous relationship is I continued to evolve. And he didn't like the first evolution, so he for sure didn't like the 20th evolution. My greatest personal value in life, and I've said this for a decade, my greatest personal value is growth. And that means that I'm constantly challenging myself to evolve and change. The other thing that comes with that being a personal value is if you're greatest value is growth, growth rarely comes easily. Growth usually comes through pain, through being challenged, through having to learn, through evolution isn't easy. And I need to be with someone who is also evolving, who not just is also evolving, but admires the ev evolution. Who's like, damn, that's amazing. Like, again, sorry, Dave haters. I mean, I'm a Dave hater too. Um, What more could Dave do? He literally quit his job. I mean, he claims that he had, you know, maybe he got pushed out. I have doubts about whether he chose as much as he says he did. But he went to work at the company. He became, you know, he was CEO, which I think there's a lot of issues with that. But I think that shows that he believed in the business. I don't know how much more belief you need to have. I guess he could have came in at a lower position or something, but... 
you know, I, I, I don't know what she wants. Like, he, he, from what I saw, he went with her to the Rachel, or to the Rachel Hollis conferences. He did. He went with her to the Tony Robbins conferences. He wrote his own self-help book. He became the CEO of a self-help company for women. Like, what else can he do? <laughs> he didn't run, he ran marathons with her. They ran, he, she didn't like when he ran a marathon without her or a half marathon or whatever. So it, the, the direction seemed confusing. Like I'm trying to put myself in his shoes. Like, okay, if I wanted to prove to my fiance that I, I was dedicated, like he, whatever he was saying, I wasn't like, you're not growing. Okay. How can I show you that I'm growing, that I want to grow, that I'm interested in growing. It's like, she just wants a new boyfriend. That's what she wanted. She's bored of Dave. She's sick of him. She found success. She doesn't need him anymore. She wanted to move on. That's the story. In my opinion, she's making it seem like he's done all these horrible things. And maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. I don't know. She didn't seem to have a problem with it for 18 years until she found success. And then all of a sudden it's, it was too much. I don't know. But yeah, it's like how much, to me, he seemed, he's still doing self-help. Like what does growth mean to her? And what does it mean to everyone listening to this podcast? Like what does it have to mean? And I, I think there's a word for it and I'm sorry that I forget, but it's like, it's like when you, when a celebrity levels up or goes to someone who's a higher celebrity. So for example, like when Pete Davidson got with Ariana Grande at the time, everyone said there was like a word. It was like, he, she brought him up to that level or something where it's like, you know, you're one level of celebrity, then you date someone and you marry them. And it's like, Oof, you've like jumped up a, a huge amount or now, especially Pete Davidson with Kim Kardashian, he's on a new playing field of, you know, celebrity status. That's what she's suggesting, that that's what you need to do. You need to find someone who's better than you, who can like prop you up. It's like, why don't you work on yourself and find, get to a place where you're comfortable and then find someone who matches you in the moment and then you can grow together. That'd be my advice. Instead of like getting a leg up, like, oh, I wanna find someone who's gonna help me. You know, that's what she did. She found someone who's got more money, was older, could give her some capital so she could start her business. Cause she worked in like a real job for what, two years max? She didn't have to work in an office very long before she was an entrepreneur. So she, she sucked it up for two years until she got Dave and then, you know, moved on. I think this is all, this is called the projection of Rachel's breakup, <laughs> putting all the blame on others, none of herself and giving it, it out as advice. Yeah. Marrying up. I'm seeing that one. Yeah. Yeah. You marry up, date up. Exactly. Okay. That's not. That's not, that's mean, I think. You're just picking someone who's got better options. That inspires me. And then he inspires me how he's evolving and I inspire him how I'm evolving. And it really works because we are a match for who we are today. We're also a match for who we're gonna be in 20 years. Most people are only looking sort of what's right in front of them. Oh, right now today, you're a great match for the person that I wanna be with. And look, that serves a purpose. You can have fun, you can be supportive, you could be in love. I guess a big part of this too is I am I am future oriented. My mind, I, I work really hard to be in this present moment. I do that through prayer and meditation and just a continuous learning about that process. But I am future focused. As I came out of my mother, focus on the future. I mean, I am a little girl. I can show you diary entries from when I can barely write. And I'm talking about what I'm gonna be, where I'm going. That's just how my brain works. And so I'm constantly, it just, for me. Or it's a trauma response. <laughs> if you're constantly, and I did this when I was a kid too, when you're unhappy with your current life, you end up, if it was better in the past, you might think about the past, but if it, you, you're a child, you think about, oh my God, I wanna be famous. I'm gonna be a rich woman. I'm gonna be a millionaire. I'm gonna be president. I'm gonna be all these things because it helps you fantasize out of the situation you're in. It's not like, oh, wow, I'm a, it's proof of success. It's like proof that you probably had a bad childhood or a childhood that had trauma in it. And as we know, she has and had and says that she went through a lot as a child. So don't give that as a good reason as to why you're, you know, the way you are. It's like, that's pro it's the way you are, but it's because of trauma, not because it's good advice. Like, oh, I'm just a future thinking person. It's like, yeah, a lot of people are when they're, when they're sitting in prison, like they think about when they get out. It's a very natural response. It's not like, oh, wow, she's cracked the code to entrepreneurship. I don't think it would be possible for me to be with someone that's like, you're missed. You know, they say like Mr. Right and Mr. Right now. I just don't, I can't fathom that. I, I, 
I, I, I like to like imagine a world where like I'm cool and like I'm a player and I like, I don't know, like go on dates and like meet all sorts of people. But it's just not my vibe. I really wouldn't be with someone that I couldn't see myself being with long term. I'd rather just be single because sort of at least to me, it's it's like, what what's the point? And there's all kinds of kinds. Right. So if you're like, oh, girl, I just went through a breakup and I'm trying to like meet all get it, live that life. But for me, I I am future focused. And so I had to be mindful of choosing a partner that would be would make sense in the future, too. And AKA she picked a partner that was going to have money so that in case her company never returns, she'll be fine. That's what she's saying without saying it. And you know, it's not bad advice. If that's what you're after, if you want monetary success, if you want to be comfortable monetarily in your life and you don't really have a personality, do it. That's it's going to work for you. I just don't think you're going to be happy. And that's what she claims she's after. And I don't think this is going to, marrying or dating someone who's got cash uh and doesn't you know call you or whatever you're like whatever doesn't ask you questions that's what that's the trade-off it's not good for me but for other people maybe who knows just to speak on that for a minute because i really think that being better after a breakup is a solo mission i think it's something you do for yourself by yourself but most people do ask like, okay, but how did you find love again? Or what if I do want to date? Or how do you find, I, I really, the best piece of advice I could give you for finding someone wonderful is to become someone wonderful because we, you know, law of attraction, you don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. So if all your friends are, you know, gossipy mean girls, you got to ask yourself some questions. If you keep attracting losers I'm not saying you're a loser, but there's something in your energy that believes that's what you deserve. You're putting out a vibration and then getting the universe's response to it. I was talking to one of the younger women on my team and she was saying like, she's like, I just keep finding these like boys. They're just like not really in it. And they're (laughs) she's like, at least she called her a younger woman on her team. Uh, maybe she's and she's going to talk about how this woman says that she keeps dating boys and that Rachel's going to say, well, you need to date a man, baby. And that's her, you know, sage advice. Um, maybe maybe this woman on her team that she now calls a woman feels like she can only attract boys because uh, her boss, Rachel, calls her kid all day long at work. <laughs> maybe that's why. Maybe it's some sort of Freudian thing that she's thinking like, oh, my boss thinks I'm a child, so maybe I can only date boys. Thought about that, Rach? No. Like, don't really want to date and they keep ghosting and we have a great time. And And I said, well, first of all, the fact that you just said I keep finding these boys and you're in your late 20s, that's the first thing we got to fix. Because you're all that is your vision is that you're going to find little boys and little boys, of course, are not going to be committed to anything serious. Right. Secondly, you you literally said in this conversation, like I they always are. She kept saying things like that. They're all this way, whatever. I'm like, you have decided this is the truth. So that is the only thing that you are going to attract into your life is the vibration that you're putting out. So ask yourself, like, if you want to be with someone, like if you've never done this, write a page like my ideal partner is right. They're funny. They're kind. They're, you know, they care about their community. They have strong faith. They are a hard worker. Like, I don't care what it is. Just make your own list of what it is. And then ask yourself, do all of the characteristics on that page apply to you? Because if they don't, you've got some work to do. You don't even need to be looking for someone. You need to be growing those characteristics inside of yourself. How jacked is it to be like, I want someone who's, you know, highly educated and hardworking, and then you're not doing anything to make yourself in those ways? right? I I want someone who's health conscious, but you're not health conscious. I want someone who volunteers and cares about their community. Like, in fact, I think sometimes when we make that list, it's actually the person we wish we were. So fantastic. You've got marching orders. But then, okay, but uh, it's contradictory to what she just said. She said like, okay, now she's saying if, you know, make a list of the things you want in a man or a woman or whatever. And then you, if you're not those things, then you have work to do. It's like, but aren't I supposed to be dating up? Or aren't I supposed to be finding someone who I aspire to be? So if I like someone, if I want to volunteer later when I'm rich and famous and celebrity status, like that's who I aspire to be. So wouldn't I date? the person who volunteers now because I'm going to be like that in the future. 
if I'm just going to do all the things that I'm looking for, isn't that in the present moment, finding someone you're matched with in the present moment? And I don't disagree with what she's saying a little bit with, she says like, okay, I, I know a lot of people in my life who have wanted, like, I want a tall man, rich, uh, skinny or not skinny, muscular, like all these, like f mostly physical attributes and like materialistic attributes. And then you look at them and they're like, they don't go to the gym. They, they, you know, work a part-time job. Like I understand what she's saying there. It's like, yeah, maybe the things that you want are actually things that you should be doing in your life. I get that. But then the rest of it, I'm just like, well, I'm confused because you said I'm supposed to date in the future. And then also, is this, there's no talk of love in any of this connection and, and empathy and understanding of each other. Good conversation. This is all materialistic stuff. So where's that? How big of a percentage is, all, is, is that of, of this thought of getting into a relationship with somebody? It seems like small. Anyways. You've got something to focus in on, and I swear to you, if you focus on making yourself wonderful, like huge, huge, huge reason why I found my boyfriend is that I was not looking for him. I was focused on myself and like... She met him on a dating app. <laughs> Jesus Christ. She's not going to bring that up. How She just like, thinks everyone forgot that she met him on a dating app. How is that not looking for him? That is literally the definition of looking for somebody. I'm going to be the best mom ever. I'm going to take care of these babies. I was focusing on having fun with my friends. I was focusing on becoming the better version of myself. And I've said this before, but one of the big things I was focusing on at the time and practicing gratitude, like my gratitude practice almost every single morning involved me feeling gratitude for my friends. I have the most amazing girlfriends and every morning I just be like, I'm so grateful. And I would just focus on friendship and support and love every day. And I think the vibe I was putting out to the universe was like friends, 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 friends. And the joke is that both he and I were just friends. In fact, I literally looked it up in my journal because I was just curious because we've joke? just passed a year since we met. And I looked it up in my journal because I just wondered, like, what did I journal about him when I first met? And I really was journaling, like, oh, I just met the coolest guy. Like, he's going to be such a good friend, you know. And then I – it's so hilarious. Like, I don't talk about him again for three more weeks because he's just a dude that I knew. And then I'm, like, the next journal entry is, like, that's such bullshit. If she had met him walking down the street or she dropped her handkerchief or something, you know, like, in the 50s and he just happened to pick it up and they had met, okay, I'm all on board. Like, I wasn't looking. This guy – you know, literally I fell on the floor and he picked me up or I, you know, whatever, like the case, I would be all on board. Uh, or even if it was like a friend of a friend and you met at a party and you just, we weren't even supposed to be there and you sat next to each other by, uh, by happenstance at the dinner party. That's a whole, that's even like less, you know, but even so, still on there. This is the least story that I could ever believe that, oh, I did not want to be with somebody. Then she also talked about how she was in Hawaii before she met her boyfriend, how she got the guy's wallet or whatever. And she was looking at his picture and thought he was so cute. And then she was disappointed that he was married because he said, oh, my wife or whatever. So she was like, oh, dang, I can't like go for him. So that seems like you're also in the mood to date and meet guys. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But don't act like, oh, just friends, like as if also you, like you've known this guy for 20 years. You just met him on a dating app. That is the most traditional and now not traditional, but like common way people meet each other that want to date dating app. You did it. Now you're going to say like, I'm different. I'm different though. I'm not like other girls. I'm not like other girls. I don't use dating apps. I mean, I do, but I don't, I only use them for friends. <laughs> like, okay. Okay, Rachel, relax. It's okay. You can, you're allowed to go on a dating app. Jesus. I ran into him again and we had so much fun and whatever. And it wasn't until like five journal entries in where I literally was like, I feel weird. Like I'm feeling weird. I'm feeling some kind of way. And I don't know what this means. And like, what do I do? Cause we're friends. And then every journal entry from there was me spiraling out over like, Oh no, I have a crush on this guy and I don't know what to do. I figured it out. <laughs> the point is I attracted what I was energetically put putting out, which was dear friendship. And that's what I found. And I can't think of a better foundation for a relationship than that. It just so happens that he's really sexy and also we like making out with each other. So that works well. The last thing that I wanted to say about this topic is to be really careful that you believe that you've moved on, but you really haven't. I have a lot of girlfriends who have moved on, dating someone else, dating someone great, life's good, but man, they always know 
what their ex is up to. They know all the cheese may about his new girlfriend. They got all the crap to talk. If you get him going, there's a lot of anger bubbling under the surface. I just, even if like your ex screwed you over, like even if they're a monster, if you're still focusing on them in any way, if you know anything about their life. Now, if you create 17 podcasts with the uh, clickbait title of red flags that I have found in my divorce and in my relationship with my ex-husband, Dave, David, um, this is, I think it's a joke at this point. She's got to be joking. She's got to be trolling. Like she literally is saying all the things that she has not done. Wait a long time. Didn't do that. Don't look for uh, a mate. Went on a dating app. Um, be over the ex. She's not over Dave. She's talking about him all the time and doing things, ma running marathons for God's sakes. Thanks, Misty. Welcome. She's running marathons, I think, to telepathically tell Dave that she can do things that he can't do. Everything she does is for Dave, in my opinion. And the fact that she, yeah, I see someone says she's so smug. She's so smug. It's like, take a second to have some, some reflection, even if it could be construed that you could be hypocritical. I think I would think twice about recording this podcast, but no, there's no thought more than, yep, this is what my girlfriends do. I have so many girlfriends that do this. It's like, bitch, this is you. <laughs> Let's be real. Definitely for me, I still have to know what's going on in my ex's life because we have kids together. The kids are not the unfortunate part, but I do wish like I could go through a breakup like other people and just never have to deal with this person ever again. That's not my truth. Like other people, like young people that are like teenagers, that's what it seems like you want. A lot of people break up and have kids. This is not the advice for them. That's not my story. And so I have to know and deal with what my ex is going through, unfortunately, all the time. But if you don't, if you don't have kids, but you still know all the cheese may, you know, all the information, I'm different. you got all the details and you've got any sort of negative emotion about that person, you are a slave to that human. Energetically, you are locked in and you are giving them the energy that you should be using on yourself. Not even the energy you should be using on someone new. Screw that. You gave this person energy for years and energetically, you are still tied together. You are still in it with them. If you can't, like, there's a Taylor Swift song that I love from the Lover album. Uh, that's called I Forgot That You Existed. And I highly recommend that you listen to it. Uh, if you are going through a breakup or went through a breakup, that just so happened to be what I listened to a lot when I was going through mine. And I love it because she says the whole idea is like she forgot that her ex existed. She said the opposite. She didn't say this, but it's an old quote. But the opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. That you think about that person, you're like that it means there's zero emotion that comes. Either when it comes to our ex, I think the goal should be either that you can think about them and you feel nothing, or you can think about them with a platonic love. That you can think that you can find love for what happened, what was, and this is my own meditation when it comes to my ex. I would not have my children if it wasn't for my marriage to him. So I can find love. For she makes it seem like it was the worst marriage possible. Like the ho the horrible, the most, there's nothing good that came from it. The whole time it was just awful and horrible and disgusting. And she did it because she needed to save her money to have her multi-million dollar mogul business. And she sacrificed her whole life of happiness for, for this horrible man. It's like, that may be true in her eyes, but why then create a fucking love podcast about how great your relationship is? Why sell the marriage conferences, how to have an um, exceptional marriage like us? That's where I get pissed because it's all garbage. She makes, she, she just changes her story and you know, she's a writer. I guess you can rewrite her history whenever she chooses to, and that's her right. But I, you know, this is why I feel like it's important to point this stuff out because there are people I would imagine who unironically listen to this and go, yeah, you're right. I need to work on this. I need to go drive to uh, Dunkin' Donuts tomorrow and then, you know, not go on a dating app and, and, and get over my divorce. It's like, this is not going to help people. This is just her way of, of dismissing any criticism.
that may come in the future or has come in the past. There's no value in anything that she's saying. 99% of everything she's saying. And the value that she is giving, it's like you could get that from anywhere else. It's probably better to get it from somewhere else because you can trust it more. Even on the days when I really don't want to. So I'm not at the indifference part yet, but I can, whenever I find myself starting to like feel negative or feel frustrated or feel whatever, I can meditate on just finding some kind of love, like wish them love and then send it away. Wish them love and send it away. Louise Hay says, when we don't focus on things, they wither and die. So you obsessing over the ex, you're, you're actually giving life. You give life and energy to where they are, what they're doing. And you just are, you're, 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 you need to sever that tie because you are never going to be able to fly and grow and become the person that you want to be, which is awesome, by the way, if you are. Okay. Uh, she just quoted Louise Hay, right? That's who she just quoted there. Louise Hay also says that the reason you have that people have muscular dystrophy is because they think that that per this is ex this is from this book. I can't see it because it's too bright, but that's what it says. Uh, it's not worth growing up. That is their limiting belief that has caused them to have muscular dystrophy. Okay, so let's stop taking advice from Louise Hay and quoting her from now on, please. Uh, because that is not a good person to take quotes from. Yet here we are, Rachel Hollis is quoting Louise Hay. I'll just complain it. Energetically tied to something that you shouldn't be. So those are my ideas for y'all. Those are my ideas for today. And I hope that you found this helpful. I, I know that it's really hard to go through a breakup. Whether you chose it or they chose it, whether it was a mutual decision or they left you or they cheated on you or I, I know, I know that it's really hard, but this is your journey. This is this specific chapter in your story and you're just getting started. I don't care if you're listening to this and you're like, no, Rach, I'm, you know, I'm 67. I'm not just kidding. I'm 74. I'm not just kidding. BS. You have a lifetime ahead of you. A lifetime. You, oh, okay. You're 50 years old. Great. With the way people live today, you got like 40 more years minimum. That means that you have a whole second half of your life. Like as long as you've lived today, you've got a whole second half of your life. What are you going to, you're going to live it being miserable or you're going to live it being sad. You're going to sit in your house and do nothing and try nothing and experience nothing for what? It is a myth. Like if you're lucky enough to be the person who met someone in high school and until you were 98 years old, you know, or like that scene in the notebook, you're both older and you hold each other in the night and you both die and move on to the next round of life or whatever while holding it. Like if you're lucky enough to have a lifelong love, that's amazing. That is freaking amazing. But guys, that's very unlikely. So you went through a hard breakup or you went through this thing. That doesn't mean this is the end. This is the freaking beginning. You can be in a season and decide like, okay, that's it. I really thought this was going to be my person, but like it's over now. Or you decide that, oh, this is what was necessary in order for me to go to the next chapter. And I, oh God, you guys, I can't even tell you. It's so good on the other side. And it doesn't mean that there aren't scars from that. And it doesn't mean that it wasn't painful, but I cannot imagine. I literally can't imagine still being in that. It was so like, I just, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that where you like have just tried to hold it together, tried to hold someone else up for so long. And then all of a sudden that weight is gone. It's the most. Don't obsess over your ex and don't give him any, don't talk about him or think about him. I had to hold my ex up for so long that his weight was so heavy on top of me. It's like, okay. Seems like you're still obsessed and you really want to put him down. I think he's at a pretty low point right now and maybe he deserves to be there. Who's to say what he actually did? I don't know what he did because no one tells me. No one says it. They just dee -dee -dee -dee, go around the point, beat around the bush. Um, but come on, like your life was so horrible with him, but yet you allow him to come into your company and to stand up and tell your employees, your, your fellow children uh, on your team what to do. If this guy is that horrible, why would you allow him anywhere near anything? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. 
the fact that he doesn't want to watch The Witcher, like get over it or divorce him and move on. But stop trying to make it like seem like, oh my God, this guy like abused me because it makes it seem worse than it probably was. And that downgrades everyone's actual abuse stories, in my opinion. Like if you're saying like, oh my God, like this guy was so horrible to me. He didn't watch the shows I like. It's like, okay, other people have other issues. And taking the advice, it's important to know at what level that you're talking about, what level you're speaking of. And it seems like she's at a very low level of, you know, discomfort. She's bored. It happens to people all the time. Take some responsibility and say you were bored. You divorced him because you wanted to be single because you never got the chance. And just do that. Oh, I'm on the other side. It's so good over here on the other side. Shut up. Ugh. It drives me insane. She drives me nuts, I'm telling you. Oh. Thanks, Kendall Sue. Wow, okay. I, wait, let me see. Uh, she, okay, has she ever owned up to all of her relationship advice being bullshit now that they're divorced? No, the only thing that she said, and she mentioned it in the, um, podcast with the Skinny Confidential, is that people look to them for advice, the community, her community that, that was built without her help, the community formed without her, according to her, um, they looked to her for advice, therefore they took, you know, they, took the opportunity to, to help people. Um, but that they actually talked about all of their problems all the time. So they're, you know, they were not lying that they had an amazing marriage. They said they had issues constantly. So how could they ever be told that they were lying or making it seem a certain way? She's just so confused as to how that could have happened. So yeah, that was, that's how she handled that. She basically said like, People took advice that they wanted to take. We were honest about all, all of our problems. And then she also said, you know, they had been working on something for five years that they ultimately caused them to break up. But then within two minutes later, she says, there's a secret thing that happened that I'll never tell because of my kids. So I'm confused. I don't know what the truth is. Only they do. And I, unfortunately, <laughs> don't live in the Hollis house. So I don't know what's going on uh, at all hours. But, you know, I, I'm starting to think like nothing actually happened because they originally were saying like it was a thousand little things that happened. And I think that's what it is. I don't think that there's this big, deep, dark secret anymore. I think she wants you to believe that. So you keep listening to our podcast like I do to find out the information. But there's actually nothing at the end of the rainbow. It's just Dave being Dave the whole time. Anyways, okay, we're almost done. She's got her last sermon to preach at us. Profound, life-changing thing that's ever happened to me. And yeah, I just want you to hear that life can be really good. The new chapter can be really good. It can be so much better than you ever thought. You can be more yourself. That's what's come out of this. Like not some wild, crazy life, not, you know, oh, uh, I heard someone say this the other day and it sort of annoyed me because I felt like it was like a gross attitude, but like they were describing a friend of theirs so it was a guy describing another guy whose wife had decided to leave him. And I don't know the people and I don't know the circumstances, but he was like, you know, yeah, I guess she just wanted to like go like live her own life and just sort of have a different kind of lifestyle. And he was like so judgmental about it. And I was sort of in my brain, I was like, why is that bad? Why is that wrong? It's, it's twisted. And I know like I'm, this is going to sound so controversial and you can take this for whatever you want to take this for. I met my ex-husband when I was 18 years old had never kissed another person, had never had sex, obviously, hadn't done anything. And there are stories where that is someone's and they live their whole life and it's beautiful and amazing and we're all jealous of those love stories. But with as much as I've grown, with a personal value of growth and continued evolution, there is no way that I could have made a decision at 18 years old that would still be serving me at 39 unless I just so happened to have wisely chose a partner who cared about that evolution as much as I did. And that's okay. That's nothing against him. We, I believe that we're all on this journey of life and everybody is on their own path. Everyone is on their own journey. I don't begrudge him for being on a different path. I do get frustrated, especially when people judge the partner who decided to leave so that they could honor their path. 
when I, you know, I heard that friend like telling the story about the, and who knows, maybe the path she wanted to leave her husband for was like, you know, shooting cocaine into her eyeballs or something. In which case, yeah, that's questionable and we should talk. But just because someone's path diverges from yours doesn't make them a bad person. And I want you to hear this. I think the issue that I have and what she's saying is is not wrong inherently, but I think where she's coming from is wrong, I guess. If if she was to just say that, like she want I wanted to go and live a life that I never got to experience because I got married so young. I got married at 18 or 19. I had kids at like 22 or something. Like she didn't have much of a chance to have a childhood or like a young 20s. She was a mommy and like immediately and has four kids and has young, a young kid. She has no t- time to like, you know, not have a family, which was her choice though. You chose that. People make choices all the time to have children, to not have children, to get married, to not get married. Just because you made the wrong choice or a choice that you regret doesn't make your partner a bad person automatically. And she's upset that people are judging her for leaving. People aren't judging you for leaving. We're judging you for saying that the reason you left was because, you know, oh, this guy was just so awful. Meanwhile, a year before, not even like months before holding conferences about how amazing your marriage was and how other people could model you. That's what people have. And she knows that. I'm sick of repeating this because she knows she's not dense. She's a smart, savvy, independent-ish person who can understand concepts very clearly about her own life. So she gets it. She's just acting dumb because a lot of people think that that's acceptable behavior, whatever. So it's just the lack of acknowledgement that I'm the woman. She's not, it's not this wife that wanted to go shoot cocaine into her eyeball. She is the woman that wanted to go explore life. There's nothing wrong with it, but just say that because you're really not being, you're not empowering women to just say, okay, I'm going to walk away from my marriage to explore by saying, oh, my partner was hurtful to me. Therefore I left. That's not the same thing. She thinks it is, but it's not. She doesn't want any responsibility. She wants no burden of leaving. She doesn't want people to judge her, but she also doesn't want to be, you know, someone who says like, I just wasn't happy. Sorry. And I shouldn't have had marriage conferences. That was wrong. That's all anyone wants, but she will never say that. Apparently. If you're someone who's grappling with, you know, in your heart of hearts, you know, in your gut, in your soul, you don't want to admit it to yourself. And maybe you're not even ready to admit it, but you know, in your heart that this relationship has come to an end when you are ready, because it took me years. So I'm not going to tell you to rush the process, but when you are ready, you are not a bad person because this has run its course. Because this is no longer working for you. This is no longer healthy for you. This is no longer, because the thing is, if it's no longer healthy for you, then it's definitely no longer healthy for them. You get one chance to do this life. One, you need to choose wisely. Because the life that you are living today is a result of the decision you made six months ago, of the decisions you made a year ago. You are living the result of your past decisions. So if you want a future that is different than your current reality, you have to make some new choices. And if you've gone through a breakup or are going through a breakup, then the decision that you have to make is to become a better version of yourself on the other side of all that you're going through. All right, you guys, I love you and I'm rooting for you. And I hope that this was helpful. If you have questions about relationships Don't ask me. You know, what to do next or frankly anything. I get a lot of my inspiration from listeners who call into my hotline and ask me questions. So please feel free. You can, when you record it, you can say like, hey, this is Sarah and you can use my recording or you can say, hey, this is Sarah. Don't play my voice. I just want to ask you this question. That's fine too. That hotline is 737-400-4626. 737-400. Ay, ay, ay. So that's Rachel Hollis as a relationship guru once again. Uh, Her advice is, you know, don't feel bad about walking out of your marriage. You're always right in all situations. You know, do whatever you want. That's not what I did, but do whatever you want. Don't feel bad about it. It's like, okay. And I, I think a big thing that, you know, she did not bring up once. Not one time that I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, 
Did she bring up her children and how children do, unfortunately, sorry that that happens, but it's part of life. Children are a part of divorce. You have to consider their feelings. And I'm not saying you should stay with an abusive person because you're married to them. Definitely not. But if you just want to go and explore or whatever, is divorce really the best thing? You got to take, the, I guess, take the responsibility of that too. Like, look, they're going to have to, they're going to have to get through this. They're going to have to work through this through with like therapy or with something. It's not going to be just like, oh, Band-Aid. Oh, now they got a you know, blended family. Oh, Heidi's got four kids. Perfect. We'll just match them up and then we'll go you know, to dinner and they'll all be great. It's not that easy. It's complicated. There's lots of feelings. They've gone through a lot. I didn't hear about their perspective at all through this relationship advice. The only advice I got was like, you know, leave them if you don't want to be with them. Okay, that's, that is an option for sure. But you have four kids. Are they better off having a new boyfriend immediately within the house? A new girlfriend immediately back and forth between both of them? I don't think so. Probably not. Maybe they're strong enough, they're better than all of us, that they can handle these emotional situations better than I would have. But it doesn't guarantee it. And the fact that you're not even considering that in, in any of these things, or at least she's not saying that she was considering, like, you know, I thought long and hard about my kids and how they were going to be. Didn't hear about that at all. Heard about, I got sick of it. I didn't want to put dill in his tuna anymore. Therefore, I divorced him. There was no, like, my, my adopted daughter's five years old. How is this going to affect her? Didn't talk about that, at least. And I think that's, those are the things that really should push you into thinking, at least considering what to do next in any relationship. If you have dependents, they can't walk away and leave. They can't. And she should know that. She's talked about that, being stuck in her family situation. So why would you do that to your own kids? And again, in the grand scheme of things, she's not the worst person in the world. But the fact that she puts herself on a pedestal by having a self-help podcast and YouTube channel, I feel it's fair to poke my barbs in when I can. I saw someone commented earlier today and was like, you're like the girls I knew in high school. You just bully other girls, other women. Other women don't push each other up. And it's so interesting that that's the narrative. It's like, I think, now maybe this is me being condescending, but I think talking about what's wrong with her and, and her messaging helps women tremendously more than the message that she's sending them. That's just my personal two cents. I think if women only think that this is the only advice that's good for them, or this like infantile, like rage talk, that that's how women speak to one another, if that's, that's the only thing allowed to be on the internet, then that's a disservice to women, personally. And I'm also perfect in all ways, and I've never made a mistake. <laughs> just kidding. Um, before we go, I saw some people uh, liked that I have this on my desk that I, I bought this after a recommendation from Rachel Hollis. In one of her rage talks, she talks about it and says how amazing this book is, how it's changed her life. So I've gone through it and made notes, and it's not official, but I did reach out to Savvy from Savvy Writes Books about doing a, a joint review on this, and she said yes, but we haven't planned the date yet, so I don't want to set it in stone, but uh, maybe if you're watching, this will be the incentive to, to let's plan that date. Um, but it is pretty shocking, this whole book, I will say. I think uh, the review of it will be eye-opening, <laughs> to say the very least. Uh, I put some stuff on my Instagram a while back on my story. I don't think I saved it, but uh, I read some chapters that I found particularly egregious. So maybe I'll do some more if you want to follow me over on my Kia's World account, Kia's World YT on Instagram. I have been spending a lot of time there. Um, and also, since we're here, uh, if you're interested in Choose Sadness merch that was released when we hit 10K, uh, that is still available. And it is on my Instagram and the link, bio link or whatever. Um, but before we go, I will, I will read some of Louise Hayes, other amazing uh, lines that she has <laughs> come up with. Uh, she's another one that says she cured her own cancer by doing colonics and uh, eating healthy. So take that uh, with what you will. Let me find a good one. Uh, I mean, speaking of genitals, <laughs> we could talk about that. Okay, okay, everyone vote real quick. 
Do you want one that's going to upset you or one that's going to be like, what the heck? Like a lighter one or a heavier one? Let me know and I'll wait for a second because there, there are so many options. There's literally every illness that you have or have had uh, from earaches to hair loss to cancer and uh, every other disease, basically. Let me know. I'm waiting for the comments. I know we're a little behind with comments. Let's see. Let's see. I'm not seeing any. Okay. I'm just gonna, I'm going to, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm reading the comments as they come in. I, okay. Um, so let's just, while we're, while we're voting, I'll start with, um, the anus. <laughs> Okay, uh, bladder problems, anal problems, vaginitis, prostate and penis problems all come under the same area. They stem from distorted beliefs about our bodies and the correctness of their functions. Okay, the anus is as beautiful as the ear. Without it, we would have no way to release what the body no longer needs and we would die very quickly. Every part of our body and every function of our body is perfect and normal, natural, and beautiful. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so that's that. Then it tells you to go to a different page to read the issues. I think I might have read anus already because it's too funny not to. Doop, doop. Okay, so here's a good one. <laughs> uh, if you have an, uh, if you have itching around your anus, okay, just, you know, it happens. Uh, that means that you have guilt over the past and remorse. If you have hemorrhoids, that's a separate, separate issue. Let's see. There's a lot about the, the butt area. The bootay. Uh, hemorrhoids. If you have a <laughs> if you have hemorrhoids, you have a fear of deadlines, and anger of the past. You're afraid to let go, and you feel burdened. So, <laughs> there you go. Okay, that's like some of the more like okay, that's funny, right? That's that's not a big deal. Who cares? Um. But let me go, let's do cancer. How about cancer? Okay, that's a good one. Cancer is a dis-ease caused by deep resentment held for a long time until it literally eats away at the body. Something happens in childhood that destroys the sense of trust. This experience is never forgotten and the individual lives with a sense of self-pity, finding it hard to develop and maintain long-term meaningful relationships. Because of that belief, life seems to be a series of disappointments. A feeling of hopelessness and helplessness and loss permeate, permeates the thinking and it becomes easy to blame others for all of our problems. People with cancer are also very self-critical. To me, learning to love and accept the self is the key to healing cancer. Well then, uh, that is who Rachel says is a great leader in the health community, okay? So if you know anyone who has had cancer, uh, it's their fault, according to Louise Hay. <sighs> yeah, not a fan. Uh, can't say that I recommend that book myself. And I feel worse for have read it. Read it. However, it says that they, that book sold 50 million copies, 50 million people read that and thought like, yep, this is, this is educational. How? It's crazy. I wonder if that number's inflated or what? Cause I, I can't. Oh, who published this book? Um, yeah, uh, herself. <laughs> she owns or owns. she's dead now, ironically. She must've hated herself enough for one lifetime. So she died. Um, Hay House Inc. And that's 
obviously something associated with herself. Uh, it says, Hay was an, was an inspirational teacher with more than 50 million books in print worldwide. For over 30 years, she helped people discover their full potential for personal growth and self-healing. So a bunch of self-healing crap where it's like, if you're, you know, if you're just believe in yourself, you can cure anything. Tell that to people in the cancer ward. How about that? Go, go cure some people. If you can't go to a cancer ward and read your book and it cure them, then I don't buy it. And I don't think she did that. So I'm sorry if I upset everybody. Uh, it's pretty horrible. It's pretty horrible stuff. And it, it, you know, she talks about her own experience and it kind of makes sense as to why she's saying these things because she's had a traumatic past. But that does not give you the right to give advice like this and tell people it's their own fault for being diagnosed with cancer. I'm sorry. It's just not. <laughs> yeah, she said, um, she said, uh, I'll read this. Well, we don't have to read the whole thing, but quickly I'll go through her history a tiny bit because she doesn't talk about her history until the end of the book, like the, the last few pages, like, oh, why I wrote this book. Um, and she basically said that she cured herself. Oh, she's got like 17 things in here about why she do what she does um she had three colonics she had three colonics a week for the first month after she was told she had cancer uh she had forgiven herself that was one thing and she told the doctor she did not want to have an operation and somehow through mental and physical cleansing six months after her diagnosis she got the medical professional to agree which, with what she already knew, that she had no longer any trace of cancer. Now I knew from personal experience that dis-ease can be healed if we are willing to change the way we think, believe, and act. So, yeah. And she's kind of like, she's not against doctors, but she's not for them either, I will say. That's the type of rhetoric that's in that book. Uh, so, review coming, date unknown, TBD, but sometime soon, uh, we're working on it behind the scenes, <laughs> slowly. Um, I reached out to her and then she said yes and then I never said anything back, so it's all actually my own fault. <laughs> but uh, well, I will let you know as soon as it comes up that um, when that review will be, because I think it's very interesting. It's horrible, there's nothing good in it, but you know. Still good to have a laugh once in a while, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, th yes, she did. Hi yes, she did hyphenate disease. That's her thing. Yes, a lot of self helpers like to talk about disease being your own mind creating all these things. Uh, but then, if you know people have it as children, they're like, oh well, just because you were a you were bad in a past life, or your parents gave it to you. I think she says that some something like that in the book, like it's the parents. Oh yeah, that was one thing I read on Instagram. Louise Hay said that uh, kids, kids that have glasses, they something's going on in their home that they don't want to see, so they purposely blur their eyes so they don't have to look at their family situation. It's like okay, thanks, Louise. <laughs> That's the only reason that children have glasses. <clears throat> she sucks. I mean, she's dead, so. She's no longer a threat <laughs> to society. Anyways, okay, on that wonderful note, uh, I'm going to go and uh, get some work done. And then we'll be back. Uh, I think, so I'm getting my hair colored for the first time like ever. Uh, well, I had highlights once and I dyed it back to my natural color. But I'm getting it a balayage because I want to feel good about myself and try something new. So I'm getting that on Thursday. So I believe that Camelia and I are gonna be doing cringe fluencers tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. But we will post on the community group just to confirm that because we were supposed to meet about it today and I missed it because I was doing this live. My bad. Uh, but I will let you know. So if you're interested in that, we will be live most likely tomorrow. And if not, then I'll be back at some point. And like me on Instagram and goodbye. <laughs> It's been fun. Thank you guys for making the chat so awesome. I appreciate it. I don't love you because I don't know you personally, but ta-da. <laughs>